the thing that got me out out was uh, they sent me on a, a short term preaching trip to Utah to Mormonville, USA. <laughs> Yeah, we got there and we're given a briefing on Mormonism. You know, they say the Mormon church treats women terribly. They just see them as, you know, producers of children and that's it. And just helpers to their husband and that's it. And, you know, they don't get to choose their husbands and um, just, you know, all these things that were paralleling my story. And I was like, wait a minute. Am I in a cult? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was around, um, I believe, April when I recorded with um, Lindsay and Tony on the Pit Pod. And um, so we're almost a year later. And man, okay. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and I'm not as afraid to speak out as I was before. So, um, well, Great. Well, uh, sorry to interject. I was just going to say that maybe maybe let's start there. Um, I I would be curious to to know kind of like what um, for those of of you listening that aren't familiar, Pit Pod. It's the Playing in Traffic podcast with a a former deaconess of the World Mission Society Church of God and her sister, who do a lot of interviews with former members, um, have done a lot um, to to help uh, doing a lot of similar things that we're doing here. Um, on this channel, but uh, Esperanza was interviewed um, about a year ago, is what you're saying, and and since then you're saying things have changed. You kind of have have learned different things. So maybe share a little bit about what what things you feel like you have learned. How has your story progressed? Obviously, we're we're going to get into your story, um, how you got into the WMS originally, what led you to get out, and then your experiences in there. But but you know, in this year time frame since you kind of first came out and shared your story what what are some of the things that you feel like you've learned um have things gotten easier have they gotten better um kind of yeah share a little bit about that yeah um so at the time that i recorded with tony and Lindsay, um one i was super thankful to um have the opportunity because it was a huge leap forward in healing for me um but at the time, I didn't realize. Um, gosh, I was so I was so lonely in my healing journey. Um, I was still trying to figure out what happened. What am I doing? What do I do now? Um, and I also thought that I was potentially the only one that had. Um, I knew about the arranged marriages and that they were so common, but I thought I was the only one who had one that was abusive that had one that the church tried to cover up um, and one that the church favored the male, um, even though I was the more active member. Um, So, but now I've learned that there are countless um, women and and men out there that have um, been abused at hand of the World Mission Society Church of God when it comes to the arranged marriages, whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, um, just in so many different ways. Um, and so I'm really glad that I spoke out about it initially, even though I was so afraid to do it. But now um, I- I'm not afraid to talk about it anymore. And it, it really needs to be um, talked about more. And there are so many others out there, you know. Um, so I'm going to speak for me and and for them, you know. Of course, not tell their stories, but um, the the story of this kind of abuse in the World Mission Society Church of God, you know, needs to be exposed. So, um, yeah. So I'm definitely in a place now of more um, just genuine strength. I'm not afraid of them anymore. Um, I was still very much afraid um, of of the church. Uh, when I first spoke out. Um, and now, I mean, just the the learning and realizing how many things that they lied about in their doctrine, just everywhere you turn, you find another lie that they told you. Um, and at first, it's very angering. And it make, can make you feel like, like you're dumb. Like, it's like, wow, I, I believed all of this. But, you know, you, later you learn that um, you know, these are just cult tactics. Um, and most all the people um, that are in this that come out, 
are some of the most intelligent people I've ever met. So um, it has nothing to do with intelligence, um, as we know. But yeah, um, I'm in a much better place now, enjoying life. <laughs> it's good to hear. Yeah, yeah that's great. So uh, I guess originally then, what what was your motivation to speak out on the Playing in Traffic podcast? Um, I guess both, I guess it's kind of two questions. Like, what was your motivation? Why did you feel that was something you wanted to do that was important to do? And then, and then how did you get connected with them? Did you just, was it while you're a member that you started to come across online materials like these where with former members speaking out? How did you get connected um, yeah. to them in the first place? Um, so I didn't look at any anti Wimscog content until I had actually, after some time that I had left. Um, and I had come across your platform and theirs um, just in the midst of my extreme loneliness after leaving the church um, and just listening to people tell, you know, almost a cookie cutter story to mine. Um, and you know, they get it. They went through it too. And seeing, um, it just really made me feel less alone. Um, and then I, I started to feel encouraged to speak out when I saw how much the church was trying to cover up, um, my, what had been done to me, how, when I saw, um, because members after I left, before I spoke out, they kept coming to my house. They wouldn't stop they wouldn't stop reaching out to me. The overseer would text me. Um, and, you know, you run into them at Walmart. Everywhere you go, you feel like you're being watched by them. Um, and I saw, like, how how the truth that I um, experienced in the World Mission Society Church of God was um, completely different from what the members were being told as to why I, I left the church. Um, you know, it, it was main, pointing it back to as if it were my fault that I that I didn't have faith, that I didn't um, that I wasn't praying enough, whatever the case. Um, and that that really upset me because that that's not the truth. And I think that um, just seeing starting to really see how the how the members were being deceived. Um, and then I, I felt like, you know what? No, like they've taken enough advantage of me and I'm not going to let them um, tell a fake story about me. I'm going to come out and, and tell my story. So um, here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always funny after a member leaves because the church and all cults, all cults, they actually they'll never allow there to be a valid reason for anyone to leave that organization. So they have to make a spin as to why mm -hmm. the person left and why it's their fault and why their character flaw led them to leave. Like, it's like Willy Wonka, like, oh, this one was this or that, and that's why they're gone. But it could never be the organization's fault. It's never yeah. like, oh man, we really messed up with this one. It's yeah. they messed up. They're too proud. Mm -hmm. They're too arrogant. They're too this, they're too that. And that's why they, they'll never allow there to be a valid reason for someone to leave. So you hear members who have left, you know, sometimes the rumors will trickle back to them and they'll hear like, oh, is that what they're telling people? You know, and it's very different. It's a made up story yeah. compared to what actually took place. Yeah, and, and what I noticed too is that it's they usually make up a lie that has nothing to do with why you actually left, like not even remotely close, because usually it has something to do with stuff that you can go online and find information about the church. And so they don't want to put it in people's minds at all, so they don't go on the internet. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, um, they make it so obvious that they're a cult. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. That well, that that was something as I was listening through your story that kind of <laughs> struck me was just how obvious they do make it and just things that they could pretty easily adjust uh, in the culture that should just be common sense that you should adjust the way they treat people, the way they respond, 
um, you know, as you'll hear um, uh, later on in, in uh, the story, just the way they responded to you when you were very obviously being wronged and, and abused in different ways, and the way that they handle those sort of things in such an inhuman, uh, uh, really just cold, you know, robotic, for uh, lack of better terms, uh, way. And it's just those, that fundamental lack of like just human human qualities that exist in this group when when it comes to relating to the members and and how you're treating them, how you're you're standing up for them, or you're you're you know at one point in your story you talk about how at one point you know all you were needing was just just genuine love. You just needed somebody in the organization to to show you that, you know, they saw you, they saw, they saw the pain you had been through. They saw the, the wrong that you had been uh, subjected to. They saw that and they, they recognized it and loved you in a genuine way in the midst of that. And this organization just has a culture that just does not do that. They don't do that. And, and not only do they not do that, but very often rather than giving those that are being abused and being mistreated, giving them the love and the the validation that they need, they end up demonizing you and 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 creating this narrative that that basically comes a weapon against you. Um, and so they do the opposite. And so it's just kind of as you listen through these stories, for me, it, it just continually it, it just kind of strikes me as why you know what what how can they not see it it's it's just they do like you said they do make it so obvious that they're, yeah. it's they're almost just like they know a, exactly what they're doing right <laughs> yeah yeah and they adjust they do i think as there is you know even like videos like this come out they they things that they recognize oh this this could hurt us this could hurt our image and there's when enough people i think uh start talking about it or when it becomes exposed enough public enough then they'll start to adjust different things, but it's it's but never it's never for the right reasons. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I was kind of curious about, and what I am I like to hear about a little bit is before somebody joins an organization like this, typically their life is primed up and ready for them to be um, solicited and brought in. Like there's something like transitional in their life. There's some sort of situation that they're going through. Can you tell us a little bit about what your life was looking like up until the point you were being preached to? Like, how old were you? What was happening in your life? Were you, you know, was everything going smooth or were you, were you going through any obstacles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had just turned 21. Um, I was working at an NBC affiliate, affiliate TV station um, here in Colorado and um, professionally, I was doing very well, um, but when it comes to, you know, family life um, and personal life, it, it wasn't the best. Um, I, when it comes to family, you know, um, I've got a very complicated family, um, you know, a lot of us do, it's America. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I'm adopted, um, divorced, adoptive parents. Um, Kind of a weird situation there. Um, my siblings and I are are very very different. I've always kind of felt like um, just so different from my my family that I was adopted into. And I've always I've just been out here um, in my adult life, kind of doing my own thing, figuring it out. I, I've never had that family as um, a compass in my life, um, like a lot of people might be able to say they have. Um, you know, and, and then just something that's normal, um, as you know, being like a teenager or somebody in your twenties, you're, um, you're building your community of friends, um, your, your family, your friends that are family. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I was just, you know, navigating that and you're, you're figuring all of that out. So, um, yeah, that's where, I, that's where I was. So I definitely had that, um, vulnerability where I, um, I, I wanted that like deep family connection in my life um, and later learned that the World Mission Society Church of God is the worst place <laughs> for, <laughs> for a family to be connected. So, um, but yeah, so that's definitely um, a gap that they, you know, it was an illusion that they filled it for me 
um, when yeah. it went. Because, you know, especially when you first go and there's the love bombing phase where, you know, you're the most interesting person and everyone's like smiling all the time and you feel like, wow, I could really like belong here in this community. It feels like the family need that you were looking for. It feels that friendship need you were looking for. So it always seems like a good solution when you first walk in before they start to unravel and show you more about who they really are underneath it all. But yeah. Um, yeah. how were you, how did they come up to you? How was like, what was your experience being preached to? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I was actually, you know, giving a whirl with online dating and I had met um, a nice guy. Um, he lived about an hour away in Denver. Um, he ended up being a member of the church. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, um, he, he was, he was fairly active, had been in about five years or so. I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, eventually he ended up preaching to me. Um, he preached lesson of a big tree. That was the first subject that I ever heard, which is kind of uncommon. Usually it's mm -hmm. like, you a, know, a lot of, a lot of things you're saying are kind of uncommon. A five yeah. year long member who's on dating apps. Like for me, mm -hmm. that's like. Yeah, I that, think that, that's kind of like uh, an unheard of sort of thing. Yeah, I haven't I heard think of he people. Was, um, he was one of those special members that, you know, yes. he made a lot of money. Um, you know, he was military affiliated. He was a pilot, um, you know. So, so he got a few passes. Like, that let's be really nice to get. him. Yeah, not restrict him as much um, so that he stays. So, um yeah. And then for an outsider, you see him and you think he's just a normal guy and he's not involved with the cult. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he um, had preached to me. And I also at the time was kind of church hopping. Um, I grew up pretty strict Catholic um, and I just felt disconnected when I moved to Colorado from all of that and um, fr from the Catholic church, not not God, you know. So, um, yeah, I was church hopping and man. You know, we hang out all day, every Saturday. We do all these fun activities, Bible study, Bible study, Bible study. I was like, man, that sounds great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that's how I got in. Um, and of course, very shortly after joining, after joining, um, I man, I really believed it all very deeply. So he taught you lesson of the fig tree. And then, you know, that brought you to believe 1948 was a significant date of Christ coming a second time. Yeah. So he he led with the idea about, you know, kind of like end times slash Christ already came. And then from there, how did you get into the actual church itself? Did you continue to study with him separately or was that kind of the ticket for you to go to the church and have a. Bible study with a whiteboard and the traditional style. Yeah. So we actually, um, during that time, the location here in Colorado Springs, they were changing overseers, um, you know, just shipping them all over the country. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, so they took a while to contact me. He had, you know, given them my number to reach out to me. Um, Cause of course you can't just show up to this place cause it's a cult. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we, you know, of course we had, you know, gone on more dates and stuff and we usually did a Bible study, um, when we would meet up for dinner and stuff. So I, I did quite a few subjects with him before actually going to the church, um, lesson of the fig tree, um, coming from the East, like I, I, most of the like intense subjects, um, he did with me, um, I, I learned about, you know, um, heavenly mother before going the first time. He wasn't a typical teacher, though, was he? Like, was he used for teaching regularly or um, was he just kind of doing his best with what he knew? He knew the doctrine very well. I can't okay. say um, because I also know he he was pretty busy with his job. Um, OK, so I, I don't think he was a he wasn't a member that was like every single day, you know, Bible. Going there. OK, but, you know, I, I'm sure they definitely used him because he was obviously very good at teaching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so you continued to, to study with him. And then how did you get to baptism? 
Yeah, um, they called me. I showed up at the church one day after work. I started going straight there right after work. Sometimes I'd even leave work a few minutes early because I was so excited. <laughs> thought I really thought, you know, that Christ had come and that I was just chosen and like nothing else mattered anymore. I I, I really believed it all. Um, and yeah, after three days of studying with them, um, then I got baptized. You know, they hit me with the be baptized immediately study mm -hmm. or you're going to die. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, then I got baptized and um, yeah, the rest is yeah. from there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, 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 so oh, go on, George. Well, my, my question was you were discussing why this member might have been on a, a dating platform but what is there any chance that he was like kind of put up to doing that is it does because i know um, shin chan ji they they kind of have that as a uh you know a mission field as it were where they they'll send people onto dating platforms mm -hmm. just to preach and just to get to convert so do yeah. you think that was his motivation at all or was he genuinely just um, using no i don't years? think so because um he you know, he might have been one of those members that, you know, kind of has that double life um, that they still, you know, fear the the church doctrine. But at the same time, like, you know, again, he was very in involved with his career um, and he did talk about, you know, he wanted he wanted a family um, and all of these things. And for for someone who is a very active member in the church, um, you're usually Con, uh, coerced not thinking about those things. into not yeah, wanting yeah. a family. You're told that it's wrong. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah, he definitely, so I don't think, um, and, and I actually, um, they actually rebuked me um, shortly after, you know, getting pretty involved with the church for dating him. And they told me that I shouldn't be dating and that it, that it was wrong. So, um, you know, right off the bat, you know, controlling my, my relationship um, and, you know, put an end to it. So yeah, they, they definitely don't um, encourage people to date much less, you know, online dating. Yeah. Cause that's what I was curious about actually was like, as cause you came in with this sort of relationship with this, this, um, this member, and mm -hmm. then they don't like that. They want you to be single and then they'll arrange you later and organize things differently. Cause they don't want people just to pair up break up and then if there's bad feelings between them one of them leaves i don't know they control it very very tightly mm -hmm. so i was wondering how long was it from the time you were baptized till they told you this relationship is gone mm -hmm. um i'd say it was like maybe less than two months into the church um yeah and i mean and i ate it up because it was like okay yeah the world's about to end and you know, I'm walking with Christ, so it doesn't even matter anyway. I don't, I don't need a guy. <laughs> um, so your, your feelings then toward them telling you to break up weren't negative or that didn't, that didn't put up any red flags. It, you were kind um, of. Yeah. Not at the time. Cause again, yeah. I, I really believed it. You know, I, I really believed that, you know, they were God. Um, and that what they said was, the Bible truth. <laughs> yeah. So the world was about to end. You said that was, that was in your mind. It sounds like pretty early on. So were they, were they giving dates to you at that time? Were they, they saying this is when it's going to happen or, or were you hearing anything like that? Or, or was it more just generally the doctor and, and the end of the world stuff infused in that, that was um, causing you to have that, that sort of mindset. Yeah, they didn't give specific dates. Um, I think hopefully maybe they've learned their lesson on giving dates, makes them look like false prophets because they never come true. Um, right. But um, it, it's just their doctrine in general. And if you if you believe their doctrine, if you have faith, um, then you believe the world's going to end. And you're actually, you know, usually a lot of members are praying every day that it's the last day. Um, I know I was. I mean, that's how that's how deeply I believed it. Um, I think too, it was also um, the the situations that this church got me into. Um, I, I've never been suicidal, but I mean, just getting me to the point where I was praying to An Sung Hong, asking him like, "Please come today." 
Like, I can't take it anymore. I just want to be in heaven. I just want all this to end. Um, is um, That's pretty intense. Um, it's pretty Isn't intense. That, when, you tell, when you tell people outside that, like, what you're praying for, what you're hoping for is for the world to be burnt up, you're waiting for some destruction to happen to the whole planet. Again, you're mm-hmm. longing for that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a crazy thought. And then sometimes, like, people who aren't fully indoctrinated when they hear this, they're like, wait, are you guys looking to die? Like, what, what is the, you know, and it's a weird thing to try to explain to somebody, but it is. It's yeah. like when you are that deeply indoctrinated, you're praying for the end of the world. You're mm-hmm. longing yeah. for that day. Yeah. Yeah. And so then that's, we want to say that we, that we didn't you are, have you are faith, deep. Right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you were deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we would like run around the church with our phone with a news notification that like a new war was starting and we're like, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 I remember. Or like people had the earthquake alerts on their phone. Oh like, my gosh. Everyone, there's another earthquake. You know, father's coming. I hear his footsteps. <laughs> it's yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. So yeah. how and long did it to feel like that, you know, like they get from, I, I, I'm curious to learn more to this is my whole life. Like it, it's a quick process. How long did it take you to get there? Um, it was very quick for me because um, just me personally, um, I've always felt close to God growing up um, and God was important in my life. And, um, I was always curious about, you know, when Christ came to earth and, but, um, and I didn't know a lot about, um, you know, potential second coming prophecies, yada, yada. And so, um, just when I heard all of it, it was like, wow, you know, uh, I believed it to be true. And so, because that was already such an important part of me inwardly, um, of course, it just took over my life immediately. Um, again, like nothing else mattered. I I changed my job, changed my friends, um, everything, clothing, everything immediately. Um, and it, it became whatever they wanted me to do. That was my life. And did you have people around you that were close enough to you at that time to who showed any concern or asked questions about it? Uh, were any of that, like that breaking away from your, the friends that you had, was there any, uh, you know, drama in that? Was it, was it pretty smooth or was there kind of pushback from the outside world, uh, that caused, caused some friction? Um, my family isn't super involved in my life, so they didn't really know what was going on. Um, I did have some friends that, you know, were curious as to what was happening but i mean also they very quickly you know told me you know that you know your friends can be used by satan to pull you away from the truth now that you have it it's your treasure you need to hold on to it um you know cut off anybody or anything that could potentially lead you astray um so anyone who even seemed like they were questioning what I was doing immediately. They were, they were done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And, and thankfully I've, I've since been able to rekindle some really great friendships um, that I had previously. So super thankful for that. (laughs) But yeah, um, I, I, uh, it was very quick um, for me that I just cut everything off and nothing else mattered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's awful. The way that they're able to do that is like, well, at least it's for you. It's like from friends to Satan to friends again, because mm-hmm. you know that's it, it's crazy <laughs> because you are you trust these people, you're close to these people, but then this indoctrination that happens at the church, they really know how to work your fear and manipulate you to cut off every single person that might tether you to the real world. Yeah, you know and. Now, like all your time is just absorbed in this other group. Now, these are your only friends. These are the only people. And they're all saying the same thing, all supporting the same thing. So it's hard to break out of that cycle, that mental cycle, when you're surrounded with all Mm -hmm. these like-minded people just in the echo chamber. 
Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and oh, go ahead. Well, I was just saying maybe just to take a take a moment to emphasize that that point there uh, for possible members that are watching or people kind of you know tossing back and forth whether to stay or leave. You know, there's that. I'm sure every member has experienced that to some degree, at least that initial demonization of everybody on the outside, even your family, your family who has loved you, cared about you uh, in, in most cases, anyways, more than anybody else that's ever been in your life. And, and you get into this group and one of the things you're going to be told, and I'm sure most of you or all of you who have been in the WMS listening can attest to this. You're going to be told things that cause you to have a negative perception of them. And so you, you just think about that. There's really only two, two options here. When the WMS tells you that, when they're, they're, they're communicating these things to you about your friends, about your family, about the outside world, that, oh, they can be used by Satan and you gotta be careful and, and kind of put, injecting this fear. The two options are e either they're telling you the truth and, and that's true, that your family is going to be used by Satan and they're going to try to keep you from the quote unquote truth or they're lying and they're telling you these things because it's a good way to manipulate you into giving, uh, uh, giving to the organization more of yourself more fully. And it removes a lot of the potential uh, danger uh, from their perspective of you uh, leaving the organization and, and, and eliminating a lot of the, the influence that might cause you to have doubts or questions. So that's just something that I, I want to just in this moment, just encourage people to think about why, why is it that that's such a, a, a common thing that this, this group does is that one of the initial things they're going to do is try to make you have negative, uh, really just look at your families, the closest people in your life who have been with you for years who obviously care about you and love you, they're going to give you a perception of them that they are evil and they're, they're, they're trying to, ultimately they might be trying to harm you or, or standing against uh, God so that your, your perception of them is going to be one of withdrawal. And, uh, and again, you're just going to see them as Satan. You're going to see them as demons. You're going to see them as evil. And so I just, there's, again, there's two options there. Um, and, and just something to consider. Think about those times where you have been given that sort of information, where those things have been communicated to you. And, and do you really think that this organization is telling you those things because they, because that's really the truth? Or, or maybe do they have some nefarious, selfish intentions behind that? And, and is that maybe just a tactic to get more control of you and your time and your devotion. Yeah. Yeah. A good way to like, look at it. If you, if you're a member and you are to look at that, at it uh, from the outside, um, you know, if you think about like an abusive relationship, you know, maybe a, a woman that has an abusive uh, partner, um, he usually is going to seclude her from her friends and her family. Mm -hmm she can't go to the family gathering because he's upset with her. She can't talk to her friends anymore because he's worried that, you know, they're going to encourage her to cheat on him or whatever it is. You know, it's exactly the same really. Um, and, and ultimately it's narcissism. Um, yeah. whether it's, you know, a, a two person relationship or the world mission society church of God. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And then they create this us versus them mentality that cult groups do. And actually, um, I wanted to use this to sort of segue into um, one of the stories that we had uh, discussed before that you were interested to, to share. But um, one big part of a lot of the cult groups is preaching. And usually the preaching, you think it's for the outside person, you know, the person outside the organization to come in. But really, it's uh, cults use this as a way to keep people in because mm -hmm. you come to the church, you sing these new songs, you, you gather together in this community, then you're cast out to the world and you're put in these situations where people like they don't want to listen to you. They're going to be mean to you. They're going to you know, it's going to be uncomfortable. They want you to feel uncomfortable in the world. They want you to go out there and have bad experiences with mm -hmm. people of the world. 
And then after you're done with these abuses, you come back into the loving comfort of your organization again, and you feel good again. So you feel only good in the church. And when you go out to the world, it makes you feel bad. And that's why a lot of, because number one way people come into this church is through connection preaching, which means people you already know, but they try to like limit that and they make you go street preaching, which is one of the most ineffective ways to bring people in. But they do that in order to further indoctrinate you and further separate you from the outside. So Mm -hmm. I know you did have a, a preaching story that, uh, is interesting to share about yeah. the, the methods of this group. Yeah. Um, one thing um, I, I think it was Steve Hassan. Um, he mentioned cults will create a problem for you, but then sell you the solution. <laughs> and that that's exactly, you know, what you just mentioned. They, they create this problem in your mind that, everything else is bad, that your life was so bad before you got into the church Mm -hmm. when it probably wasn't. Um, And then they're like, oh, well, all you need to do is give us your mind, body, and soul forever. (laughs) All you don't forget all your money and we'll Mm -hmm. solve all your problems. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but um, yeah. So preaching, um, you know, uh, (laughs) it's always interesting um it was something i you know of course you you believe you have to do it every day or else you're going to die um and you feel so convicted and um empowered to just go and and preach anywhere and um the the church will get you into dangerous situations um sometimes when you're preaching um here in colorado springs um we have five military bases um, and including the United States Air Force Academy, it's like the, the Air Force's version of West Point, if people are familiar. Um, and so, you know, the church, they love military members, um, wh- wherever they are <laughs> in the world, because, you know, they're, they're used to taking orders and, and dressing a certain way, taking commands and, um, not arguing back. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Anyway, so we were, um, we had some members that were military um, where we were encouraged to start preaching on base. So they would, you know, sneak us onto base um, because we had a, a member or two that had the military ID to get us all on base. And then we would go door to door preaching at the barracks, um, <laughs> which is a big no no. Um, yeah. But, you know, you don't you don't care. You think like I'm walking with God. God is with me. Like we're here to save souls. This doesn't matter. You know, we could go to federal prison, but whatever. <laughs> um, oh, we're walking the lion's den. It's yeah. all right. <laughs> and it was um, I mean, but also like young soldiers that are living in the barracks. They're also in a pretty vulnerable stage in their life. I mean, a lot of them are fresh out of um training AIT they're you know separated from their families they likely just moved here they don't have any friends outside of you know the the people they work with so um they're pretty vulnerable to cults um and we got quite a few members that ended up being pretty active pretty quickly um from preaching on those bases um but eventually um we got caught um And this huge investigation happened with the United States Air Force um, where it led, it ended up being that um, we were banned from the Air Force base, bases. um, And that if any of the soldiers or airmen were caught being at the church or being involved with us, they would receive an Article 15, which means being kicked out of the military. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Or like they were already members, they'd already been baptized, but, um, like if they were caught continuing to participate with us, um, in the church. So, so what was that on the basis of, of just how you guys went about getting them into the church or was, was there, I, I, I guess that seems like, 
a little surprising to me because I'd expect them to say no more, like really cut down on you cannot come on the base and, and all that. But but what what was it that led them to go to um, that extra step of if you're even involved with this church, you'll be yeah. kicked out? That seems I don't have the intense. specific details of their investigation. Again, you know, it's it's the Air Force and I, they're not going to just release their um, findings. But um, we all know the truth about the church on the Internet um, and, you know, what they're really doing. So I'm sure that they found all of that. And it's mm -hmm. a it's a threat to, you know, the, the soldiers. It's a threat to their life. Yeah. It's a threat um, to because they're when you're in the military, you're property of the U.S. government. And so mm -hmm. them being members of the church, you know, it was a threat to the government, really. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But and, and of course, um, you know, and one of the um, soldiers, she was in my unit. And I remember texting with her, like, what's going on? And, you know, she told me all of these things. And I was like, oh, my God, that's crazy. Why would they think that? <laughs> Um, and she, she said, I don't know, but there's a, a whole investigation going on. Um, they're saying like really bad things about you guys. And it looks like they're true and we're not allowed to go there anymore. Um, you know, so yeah. And, and the church's response to it was, okay, well, we're done going to the air force base. Now we're going to go to the army. And we did. Um, <laughs> wow. so, uh, Yeah. Uh, we didn't have as much luck on the army base though. So, um, didn't last as long, but, uh, <laughs> okay. wow. yeah, you know, and another crazy thing that we did on, on one of the bases, we went to an air force football game, um, and we made huge, you know, God, the mother posters. Just imagine you're at an air force football game packed stands, and there's these like crazy group of people, God, the mother of Christ came a second time. Um, people were so mad at us, but we were like, well, we're being persecuted so hard. This means we're where we're yeah. supposed to be. Um, yeah, we super got kicked out. They escorted us out. <laughs> they, and we were like they're about the as, they were, like... as they were like chasing us out of the arena of the stadium. We were like skipping to the church vans, like woohoo! <laughs> yeah, it's wow. it's it's so bizarre because you know there there have been times where members get kicked out of like the mall, like you know. As a, as a member, and I'm like, I'm in my 30s, and I'm getting kicked out of a mall. Like, it just feels ridiculous for me, you know, when you go preaching. And, like, you know, the worst place, I think, for me to preach was Target, because typically they don't play any music at Target. Oh, yeah. So it's, like, everything you say, people are listening in. Uh, so, you know, you become a target at target because, yeah. you know, the workers can <laughs> spot you out instantaneously and give you the boot. But it's so embarrassing. But there have been members who like will post on what we used in the East Coast was group me. Oh, just get kicked out of the mall, you know, for preaching and like, you know, make a little video of themselves and post it for everybody. And then they'd get, you know, rebuked for, you know, doing such a thing. But, you know, meanwhile, you guys got kicked out in a mass group and it's a celebration. Yeah, you know, it's like you never know the response from this church about, you know, these sorts of things. Yeah. And gosh, looking back, it's like, that is crazy. Like we look like lunatics out there. But, you know, you're <laughs> like you, gosh, you think that you are just walking with God and nothing else. Yeah. You know, you but, are you are doing God's will and you don't care what people think. You don't mm -hmm. care what happens to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there but, uh, was movements where like they would go onto subways and like out to the streets shouting and screaming to groups of people. And then it was just because they wanted to have what they called simple preaching. So there was like uh if somebody yeah. just hears you talking about it or you approach them, that counts as preaching to them. So like they'd stand at the top of the escalator at the subway and have like one of those loudspeakers and microphone, just yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like, you know, God, the mother, you know, second coming Christ, he's here, Passover, you know, just like wh whatever. And then like people would just like look at us weird and 
Yeah. Walk on by. And you're like one, two, three, four, five, fifty, fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had one <laughs> yeah. to shout and one to count. So yeah, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> very uncomfortable, and I don't know how. Like, I, I'm. You're lucky. Like, no one got arrested because it. It yeah. sounds like that. That's like a federal offense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they had come and told us that we needed to put our signs down and stop shouting the things we were shouting because we were really like offending people. Um, and so we just moved to another area and we took a look around and put our signs back up <laughs> and, and then we got kicked out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. Wild, wild times. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. You know, and, and like you said that, but just moments like that, you know, they can be damaging to your life. Because, um, like, messing around with a high security, you know, government military base, I, you don't want to get on lists, you know, yeah. you don't want to be on one no of their fly lists, lists and <laughs> you um, don't want their picture, your picture, um, you know, at the gate. And, and they did at the Air Force Base. Um, they, when we were banned from it, they had like the vehicle information of members, like any of the church vehicles that had ever been on the base, they had all the information, you know, cause they have the cameras and, and everything. Um, yeah, we weren't, we weren't allowed to go on and we would be caught immediately if we tried again with that one specifically. So um, it's just, just crazy, you know, like, again, like these things, yeah, can be damaging to your life later on if, if, if it would have gone further, you know, like getting arrested, um, you know, being charged with anything, um, can make it difficult. And I'm confident it wasn't the idea of the members to just oh. do this. There's leadership <laughs> that's like, you know, pushing this along. Yeah, like, I, would, I would be surprised if they participated. Like, mm -hmm. um, like did the overseer go onto the military base and do these things too? Um, or... yeah, the, the overseer's wife did, and it was mostly her idea also. Um, like the church leader's wife or the overseer's wife? Overseer. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, um, here in Colorado Springs, it's not a huge church. Okay. Um, it's not a big temple, but it is a church church. Um, yeah. Um, like we had like one deacon, um, Okay. And like two deaconesses, and one of the deaconesses was the overseer's wife. So, um, yeah, but yeah, she would come out with us to the base. Yeah, and it that's just you know crazy. This is like being run by the leadership, telling mm -hmm. every member to do these sorts of things, and then like they're leading everybody. And can you say no to any of them? Like, what happens if you say, "I don't yeah. think that this is a good idea." What kind of treatment would you get? Oh, yeah. No, you'd be told that, you know, you have a lack of faith. Um, you know, you, you would be looked down on. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like some members have talked about, you know, in their preaching, they go to gated communities and they just climb over the gates and go oh, and knock yeah. on the houses inside. The and so, yeah. <laughs> Another thing that was being prompted and is prompted i'm sure by by the leadership um, yeah but how how did things progress anything i don't know if there's another story in there that that you wanted to to talk about but i know pretty early on you got connected uh or or you kind of experienced what the the wms uh one of the things they're um infamously known for which is arranged marriages so so it'd be interesting to get into that unless anthony there's another instance or no that, that's anymore. actually the uh the next the next thing i was interested to hear about was uh her situation with an arranged marriage um yeah so um <laughs> it uh yeah just a few months in um by the time i had been a member for just six months um i was already in an arranged marriage. Um, and the way that it um, got to that point was um, I was maybe about four months in around there. Um, I was pulled into the overseer's office and 
was, you know, love bombed, you know, told like, wow, you have such good faith. You're doing so much for the gospel. You're so talented. God wants to use you just listing out all these things. Um, and, you know, they said, we, um, we want to make your life easier so you can, you know, be more blessed by God and do more for the gospel. Um, and, you know, when you, when you're deep in this and you believe it, that is like the best thing you could ever hear. Just any more blessings, big or small, is nothing else matters. Um, and so, you know, I was at, like, wow, I was so thankful. I was like, felt so chosen. Um, and so they said, you know, yeah, we want you to live here. Um, and so, you know, we made the plan. I agreed. Um, and they, um, we set a date for, it was June 1st, was going to be my move-in date. Um to move into the church. Um, and as that date got closer, then I was pulled into the office again and told, actually, you can't live here at the church if you're single because, um, you know, and, and they put it on me. They said, if you, if you're single and you're here, um, you're going to cause brothers to sin. (laughs) Um, you're going to be a distraction. And so they said, it'd be better if you're partnered for the gospel. And then they, you know, explained, you know, when you're partnered for the gospel, it's the biggest blessing. You can grow a lot faster. You help each other um, so that it's less of a sacrifice. So you can do more. Um, You know, you'll learn a lot about yourself so you can, you know, correct your sin, blah, blah, blah. Um, Isn't that like the, the like a bait and switch? Isn't like that like a, a sales term where they yeah. give you this thing like, oh, okay, you're gonna get this great blessing, mm-hmm. you're gonna live here, and oh, then wait you a get minute, wait a minute, and then yeah. it's like, but actually, you know, you could only get these things if you also accept these sorts of payments. Mm-hmm. Like you have to, you know, they they switch yeah. it, and you, you want that prize at the end. But now there's all these extra terms and conditions that you have to overcome. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a sales tactic because now you're like, I want these blessings. I'm going to move in. Like you already have your heart set on it. And now it's like, but now you need to get married because yeah. if you don't, this is what kind of problems you're going to cause. You're going to be a sin for the brothers. Like mm-hmm. it's crazy. It, like, and the, 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 the timing of that just makes you wonder, uh, at least it, it's, warranted to speculate how much planning went in, into that in terms of the timing, like, you know, cause it seems like there's some forethought put into that. Let's, let's tell mm-hmm. her about this. So she'll probably, well, 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 like you said, they, they love bombed you. They, they kind of made it like this, this privilege, this look at this great thing you get, you're going to get to have. And then they let you soak in that for a little bit and think about that for a little bit. And, but then what we're going to do, we'll come along and, and then we'll we'll hook her with the whole marriage thing. And so obviously we I, I don't think we can say for sure, but but it it would just seem like there was there was perhaps some some you know planning involved in, in yeah, how they would real go knew. about they, that they, to, to manipulate. They yeah. knew that these problems pre-existed before right. they brought this up to you. It, it, it's, it's not, not like, like they oh, came across the handbook that, that said, yeah. oh, wait, we forgot. Oh, man, bummer. We forgot right. she has to be married. Mm-hmm. Oh, we better go. Yeah, yeah. It's like they lost the their age they of the handbook. <laughs> yeah. And, and these conditions were just made up. Mm-hmm. And they were just given to me. And I know that for a fact because a few months after I was forced to be married and move in, um, another sister moved in single. But and she we- wasn't going to be a temptation. She wasn't going to be a problem. She, none of those terms applied to her. Only to you. No. Um, yeah. And I, I love and miss her a lot. So nothing against her at all. You know, no, like, no. All, all they're doing. Um, you know, and I'm so, I'm so glad that she, you know, wasn't in an arranged marriage because they're not great. <laughs> so did that, um, but, when, when, when you saw that, when you saw her being moved in and, and kind of given different rules than you were being given, what did you think about that? Did that cause you um, any concerns honestly, or questions? Yeah, honestly, according to their doctrine, you know, I believed like, okay, well, I just get more blessings. 
-hmm. I thought I was more blessed than her because I had more um, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um, Sacrifice is needed needed to become a greater vessel is one of their uh, teachings of mother. So the more you give up for the church, the greater you're blessed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't question it. I actually just embraced it. Um, you know, I, I was, and, and they can't for a second say that I didn't have faith because I don't know how many of even the big leaders in the church right now would have had the faith six months into the church to agree to be arranged in a marriage to somebody that they weren't attracted to and had never even spoken to. Um, so yeah, they, they cannot for a second say that I didn't have faith. <laughs> so wait, you hadn't really spoken to this member who like, not, not by name, but like, you know, describe who this person was to the church that they decided would be the right fit uh, to marry. For you. Yeah. So he, um, the overseers that were there at, in Colorado Springs at that time, um, they had come from Oklahoma and he was a, just a, a member, a brother um, from Oklahoma um, who had later I found out he actually just kind of followed them there without permission. Um, like they didn't ask him to come, which, you know, in the church is kind of a no, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, I thought that, um, you know, from a, cause like, like I've mentioned before, it was like a, a, a almost like a business decision in your mind. Um, like, okay, the goal is to get to heaven and get more blessings. And I'm being told that the only way that I can do that, the only way that I can survive here spiritually and grow is by getting into this arranged marriage. And so you don't just want to, you don't want to get in an arranged marriage with someone that doesn't have a lot of faith. And so he just appeared to have a lot of faith and he had, he had bought a church van for the church and, you know, all these things. And so, um, I thought that it would be okay uh, because I, I thought that it was God arranging this um, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. So it didn't, yeah. it didn't turn out, it didn't turn out too well. Just to, no, to give a little um, foreshadowing of, of your story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it was uh It was not good. Um, you know, there were, there were many nights, um, where I would, um, lock myself in the bathroom to get away from him. Um, yeah, he was, uh, not a good person. Um, you know, uh, very, uh, very abusive. Um, and, me as a person, that is something that I would never, ever subject myself to. And there were, I remember many moments during my um, arranged marriage with him, you know, he had, you know, maybe fallen asleep and I'd be laying there thinking like, if I weren't here, I would never, I would never have chosen this person. And if it were my choice, I would run out the door right now and never come back. But I had to keep talking myself into it. But this is my blessing. This is my thorn. This is because of my sin that I, you know, because the church tells you that everything bad that happens to you is your fault. And it's according to your sin that you committed in heaven. Um, And so I just thought, yeah, like, wow. Wow this sin that I don't even know that I committed in heaven because we ultimately don't even know what we apparently did. It's like, wow, it must be really bad because this freaking sucks, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Um, and you know, when I, when it got to a certain point, I had come to my um, leader and I said, Hey, you know, these things are happening. 
um, these things are happening at night, you know, when we go home and we're done with the gospel work and I don't feel like it's right. Um, and I was told, remember that Eve sinned before Adam and you just need to submit because you're the woman. Um, and yeah, so I put my head down and I kept on. Um, so was was the ahead. abuse like immediately like how, how cuz you know you you get to know this person basically through now we're married now who are you which is not really a common thing for people to experience yeah you're getting to know him after your marriage how how did it did it ramp up pretty quickly into this or was it something that was like developed over a period of time or you um, know was it just a nightmare from day one it was pretty quick um yeah it was pretty quick but it, it it did get worse of course as time progressed um and you know it, it was really difficult um and i um you know, this person, he would all the time tell me like that, how unattractive I was, how la, 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 la. And I, I held my tongue the entire time because, um, you know, in my mind, he had no idea that I wasn't attracted to him at all. I never wanted to even be with him. I was only doing this because I thought that God wanted me to do it. And I had to follow God. Um, and it just, uh, yeah. So when it, um, the arranged marriage really um, blew up, um, I had found that he was taking pictures of me without my knowledge or consent. Um, you know, and we lived in a, so, you know, most people, most members that end up living in the church, um, the living conditions are usually pretty harsh. Um, you know, here in Colorado Springs, we were in um, a house across the street from where the, that the church owned, um, a very old, um, you know, beat down house, black mold, water barely worked. We didn't, our washer and dryer was always broken. Um, the room that he and I were um, in, had so many windows. There were constantly bugs in there. I had to check my clothes every morning for bugs. Um, we didn't have closets. Um, and yeah, so, and there was one bathroom for five people. So oftentimes like I, though I would have preferred to go like get ready in the bathroom away from him. Like I would have to get dressed in the room with him there. Um, and there was one morning where, you know, I had a weird feeling. I turned around and I caught him with his phone up, taking a picture of me. He quickly pulled it back. Um, come to find out he had this huge file on his phone of pictures of me while I was sleeping, pictures of me um, at the church before we had even been arranged. Um, oof. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, it's, it's extremely, it felt extremely violating. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I asked him to immediately delete all of them. And he told me um, that, and, and this is where like, um, I think that when an abusive person gets mixed with this church doctrine, it's an environment where they can thrive in. Um, and that was definitely the case for him because his response to me was, well, the Bible says a wife should submit to her husband. So, you know, father, mother will be pleased with you if you just let me do whatever I want. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I went and uh, reported it to the overseers. Um, you know, they did... I think that they saw they needed to do some damage control. They weren't interested in actually helping me and giving me the help that I really needed at the time. Um, but 
you know, they, they didn't want that that to backfire on their own image. They didn't want that situation yeah. to end up making them look bad. So they yeah, absolutely they were willing to to step forward and do something to change it, not not because of how it was impacting yeah. you, but because of how it potentially could have impacted them. I'm sure, and as as is the case with many members when they are in abusive situations, if if that specific instance isn't necessarily causing the church harm or making them look bad, but benefiting them, they will, they'll continue to, you know, uh, provide the means for that situation to continue going on as long as it isn't looking bad for them, you know, in many, in many cases, at least I would say. So, yeah, I think the way they went about it, they were, it's just a damage control thing for themselves, not, not yeah. intended to, to, you know, help you out. Yeah. And they, the way they did it too, was they used me to get rid of him. You know, they, they had, they had me pretend that he and I were going to go start a house church um, at another member's house, you know, but they told me, okay, yeah, we're going to tell him this, just play along with it. And then you two move there together and you just pretend like everything's okay. And then, then you can move back here after, you know, cause they, and then at this point I found out that they knew about his anger problems because they told me, yeah, uh, in Oklahoma, you know, he was always having these outbursts and we need to be careful how we handle this situation because, you know, he's a really angry person. Um, and so they just used me as their little puppet to, to get rid of him because they, they realized they needed to do some damage control. And they even, um, when I left him and he, he really fired back, um, they even used me to threaten him. And they, they told me to tell him um, that I was going to hire a lawyer and even call the police and report the things that he had done because they knew that the things that, he was doing and that they were not helping me or doing anything about, um, you know, could have gotten him in jail. And, but then they said, but uh, don't, don't actually do that though. J just tell him to threaten him because we don't want any problems with the church. That's exactly the what they of manipulation that they had over both of you. The fact yeah. that they told you like play along with us, like this is like the man that they arranged you to be married to who they told you to submit to, and now they're telling you move to a different location, act and play along, and then move back to this location. Like they planned this whole thing out and then telling you like the things to say, to, like they are controlling yeah, you completely. I was, exactly, and, and, and I, I was told, yeah. And I was told that I needed to show them every single message, anything, um, and that I, that they wanted to help me reply to him, not help me, but tell me what to reply that I, so I, I was not allowed to be in control of my own safety in those moments. Um, and, and my safety was never a concern. And there they, there you were six months into this church and they put you with a known abuser or someone who's known for violence and outbursts. And they think, Oh, th what could go wrong? God's yeah. will, but you know, it's crazy. And I, I just, I, you know, you were talking about this and like my heart really just like went out to you is that feeling of like, there's nothing I can do because you want to leave that situation, but what's preventing you, you feel so bad that I must be like the worst sinner from the kingdom of heaven. I must've really done awful things to God. I must have done really awful things that I deserve this. And if I leave, that means I'm using my own mind. I'm using arrogance. I am the worst if I leave and I'm the worst because I'm staying. So I can't go from being the worst sinner here who deserves this to even being worse than that and leaving and going against the will of God who put us together, going against the will of God. And so they make you feel so stuck that yeah. you can't do anything. And then like, even when you were trying to explain to them, this doesn't feel right. These things that are happening to me are not right. They just swept it under a rug. They just didn't care about it. And it, it would only until like it became 
so big that they couldn't control it anymore. That they had to control the narrative. And then they make up this, you will do exactly what we say. He'll move here. You will do this. You'll pretend to be like this. We'll respond to him through your text messages. It's abuse all around. Abuse from the church. Abuse, like, it's emotional abuse. It's spiritual abuse. It's physical abuse. It's all all these different things are happening to you all at once. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know how, like, you didn't lose your hair. And, like, it must have been, like, the worst I the did worst get to situation. that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, to- Tony or Lindsay, when you were on their podcast, kind of emphasized how it, you were in an abusive relationship inside of an abusive relationship. And so you just yes. had a really bad uh, hand dealt to you because you were, you know, not only in this, you know, marriage situation that was abusive, but that was contained within this larger abusive structure that was kind of enveloping that whole uh relationship that in itself was abusive and that really was was endorsing and and um you know fueling uh, uh the whole you know that that's other situation and so it's just really bad situation that you found yourself in but but i i want to i do want to hear more i i guess i want people to kind of get a grasp of just this whole aspect of arranged marriages and how that goes so badly so often as is obviously was the case for you um but kind of go, going back a little bit i guess just to kind of get help people get in the the mindset that you were in just going into this initially because again just to emphasize that you found yourself in this situation in your in your home being photographed by somebody who was your husband at the time um and so for some that that might not sound as as terrible as i think it really was but to kind of go back to even just the that initial moment i i remember you you kind of shared um that story of when you first met him i think w- maybe you had met him before but you um you, you talked about how you went home the night i don't know if it's the night that you you got married um, and, and you were sitting on your bed waiting for him and just kind of all the emotions uh, surrounding all that. I don't know how much you want to get into all that. And so feel free to say what you do and do not want to do. But just kind of help help people, I guess, get a perspective on what 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 was it like going into this? Because it wasn't just that later on down the road you realized, oh, wait, this isn't this isn't something I want to be a part of. But it was from the very beginning that you were you were really not um, willingly uh, uh, going into this uh, this this marriage, and so yeah, if you can go back to the beginning somewhat and kind of h- help people to get in inside your your mind and your emotional state um, when that all happened, kind of what 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 kind of played out there initially. Um, yeah, and first I want to say too. Um, Again, I've learned that, um, one, I'm not the only one who had an arranged marriage like this. And it's not just a certain set of leaders that do this within the church. It's I've found now that it's it's the World Mission Society, Church of God as a whole, all over the world. They're doing this everywhere. And it's not just certain leaders. Um, this is something that they teach and encourage um, when it comes to arranged marriages. Um, not all of them are abusive, and I, I'm thankful that um, not everyone has uh, had to go through that. Um, but there are also cases that are even worse than mine, unfortunately, um, and, and they're all at the hand of the church. Um, but for the the way, again, you know, I was told I had to get married, um, and again, I had never spoken to this person until the day that we were expected to move in together. Um, I didn't even know his actual name um, because what I thought was his name when I first met him, the first thing he said was, oh, by the way, that's just a nickname. This is my real name. Um, And yeah, we, um, the day that we moved in, like in an, on the afternoon, moved all our stuff in. um, And then we went all, all back to the church in the evening um, to, you know, do gospel work, go preaching, la da la da. 
Um, and then, yeah, they told me, you know, you can go home early because it's your, you know, first night with your husband. Um, and I was like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I went home and, you know, the room isn't very big. I, I wasn't there like laying out on the bed waiting for him to, you know, whatever. Um, it was just the only spot to sit. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, he came in. It was extremely awkward. Um, I felt very pressured by him. And, uh, you know, he did what he did. Um, I, yeah, but you, you think that, you think that it's what you have to do because this is a arranged by God and, um, that anything else would be wrong. Um, yeah. And, and I, I had even told him that night, like, I'm okay. I, I don't think we need to go there yet. Um, but he, he just kept pushing for that. Um, yeah, that yeah. was, that. <laughs> they, they, they've had, I've, I've been in educations like leader educations where they do go into the details that, you know, you have to do these things for your, for your spouse. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they did say in my meeting that it's not just a one way street. It's not just the husband who says when it's, you know, it's also the wife, but um, we've had actual conversations as like some of the members of the church about how frequently, you know, you should be doing these sorts of activities and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what your response is supposed to be. And they would do some they would even make these really like uh, outdated comments like, you know, uh, brothers, your wives just want to talk a lot and you'll just have to sit and listen sometimes. And then wives, your husbands will want to do this. And like it was these educations and we had to sit through and they basically told us the kind of way our, our marriage should operate. And, you know, that sort of level of intimacy was a topic and they they would tell us what we needed to do and mm -hmm. that it had to be an active part. And that if you're not participating in this, like I remember me and my, um, my ex-wife, we had a, a big argument one night and I called the leader um, and his response was Anthony, just, just to point out for people who don't yeah. know, Anthony, Anthony was in an arranged marriage as well. And yep, so in the I back of my the mind, I'm, I'm trying to count how many I've interviewed actually that, you know, as much as the church says, oh, no, we don't promote arranged marriages. How many people have I interviewed? That, that that has been the story. And it has not gone well. It's not been not been yeah. successful, healthy marriages. But anyway, sorry. Uh, Kevin, um, I just wanted people to be aware of that. Yeah. And, and you know, after after we had this argument, the first question uh, was, well, when was the last time you two were intimate? Like. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to tell you about this argument and, and you're asking me about like my personal life like this. It's very strange, but mm -hmm. they have their hand even in this part of people's marriages. So mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely part of the church culture that mm -hmm. this sort of pressure is on the members. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I, I would call him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's uh, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, as we know, I was also told, as most people are when they are arranged, that if you um become pregnant, you need an abortion. Um, that is exactly what I was told by the church overseer. Um, and I, I did end up having an abortion at the coercion of the church. Did they, um, did the overseer say it in that plain, exactly straightforward like that. way? If you get there pregnant, was, you need to do the abortion. That's the like, bro do the abortion in broken English, you know, Korean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you get pregnant, you need to do the abortion. Was and it something that, before you got pregnant that they mentioned 
or mm-hmm. it was it the response yeah. when you said, "Oh, I, this is the situation." It was, I'm in. it was something that they told me like um, at the beginning of my arranged marriage. Yeah, like if you get pregnant, you just need to do the abortion, and that's it because you know you can lo- lose a lot of blessings. And that, you know, I mean that takes a, yeah. That just kind of goes back to earlier us talking about what they do to, you know, your, how they cut you off from your friends and family, but now in just a whole other way of going about it, cutting, cut, cutting off, you know, potential children that you might have. Um, mm-hmm. they, they just, again, they just, they want that full control. So anything that might potentially lead you to be distracted in some way in your devotion from them, they don't care what it is. They don't care what they have to do. They're mm-hmm. going to manipulate you into cutting that off. Yeah. Um, that's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense, you know? Um, mm-hmm. Like I, I'm pro-choice, but um, meaning I, I'm not against abortions but I wasn't given a choice. You know, you're, you're not given a choice. It's either get the abortion or lose your blessings and risk going to hell and dying and burning forever. Like which one do you think you're going to pick? You know, if you have faith, of course I got the abortion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very true. And then like, I've been in situations where it's just because this is the teaching that they have still some people they choose to have they go through with having the child. But I've, I've been in situations where different leadership, like I'm, I'm with them and like you hear, you hear the chatter where it's like, you know, they, they, they've been trying to backtrack their teachings about abortion. They've been trying to like not be so, obvious about this uh this teaching that they have or this culture that they have where they push it but you still hear like leadership saying you know although we won't make people get abortions do you really think she feels like father's coming do you really Mm -hmm. think that she she believes that you know father is going to come soon Mm -hmm. you know and, and you become ostracized because yeah. everyone thinks that you are low in faith, that you don't really believe what the church is saying, that the world will end soon. Mm-hmm. Because they, they say, like, how dreadful it will be on that day for uh, nursing mothers and, you know, pregnant women. Because they'll talk about um, what happened around 70 AD where the food supply was cut off and they had to eat their children inside of uh, Jerusalem. And they'll say it's going to be like this in the last days where... You know, mothers, they'll have to worry about their children so they won't be able to flee to Zion Mm -hmm. and they won't be able to be saved. You know, this is the sorts of of things that I've heard. And it's just like, you know, swimming with an anchor in the ocean, you know, is kind of the way that they would put having a child in these last days Mm -hmm. where um, it, it becomes a problem. But, you know, then you see the members who have had children who kind of disregarded the pressures or they were so kind of low level that no one was going to really tell them what to do because they're already one foot out the door. Um, Because they're not going to say that to somebody who's like teeter tottering. They're going to Mm -hmm. say that to somebody that they want to use and like take their whole, because they've already gave their life to the church. They want to continue to have their life for the church. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to say that, but then you see like these little babies born and then many years later, you see these like, you know, like little preteens and they've grown up and it, it's crazy to see like, you know, weren't you supposed to be the one that prevented your mom from running the Zion in the last days? And here yeah. you are like, you know, growing up and getting married yourself. It's just like we've seen generations happen yeah. now. Yeah. And if they, you know, because most of what they teach um, is not original, you know, they, they've stolen it from other groups. And a lot of cults actually encourage having kids because it grows their numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's just interesting that um, they don't do that. uh, because They're they're very, um, you know, if if they would have never encouraged abortions, how many more members would they have right now? 
that would be making that, money for them, you know. That's that's um <laughs> that's for churches with longevity. I think that they'll they'll yeah. switch to that eventually. Yeah. Probably in my opinion, <laughs> after uh Zengel Ja and Jujul Kim, once they kind of pass away, mm -hmm. they're gonna try to become like a Mormon style of church where it's like have the children. But now it's like, think about it. If you have a child, well, you know, now your time and money is going to be going to the child. Like the child is not going to be productive mm -hmm. until they're at least 18, 19 years old and could get a job. But if you took that time you spent on this child, you could have brought in two, three, four, five people with jobs. So yeah. they're growing the money now. And then later on, they'll be able to grow the membership count mm -hmm. because the kids who grow up in the church are 50 50. Let's be honest. Well, you know, some of them grow up, go through the kids room abuse and, you know, yeah. walk right out the door. And then others become the next, you know, gospel leaders. You know, it's it, it, it's really like it really depends on um, yeah. the individual. But that's that's the method that they have now like that's the business model that they have now the business yeah. in the future yeah. it's going to switch yeah that's what i was going to say is like you can see in all that that you're saying anthony that this this all is just business decisions like it, it, it doesn't even have anything to do with their like the organization's uh commitment or reverence for their own doctrines because you know as you said like it's not that they're they're really truly concerned about the members being fully committed uh so that you know the teaching of the churches you know, have an abortion if you get pregnant that they're not committed to that doctrine if you want to call it that because in instances where they see that's not going to benefit them you know in the case of members who might that might actually push out the door well they're not going to give that that teaching to they're not going to they're not going to push that on those members so they're not really concerned with what they're actually telling you they're concerned with. They're mm -hmm. the ones who they know, if I tell them this, it's gonna give me more control than if I tell this person that they need to have an abortion, if I know that's not going to push them away, it's going to draw them in closer, give me more control, well, then they're gonna give you that teaching. But if, if, if this giving this teaching to somebody who that might potentially push away, well, we're not gonna give them that teaching because mm -hmm. that's gonna lose us the dollars of that person. And so they're not even, it's just, I think it indicates that they're just how they're not even concerned really. They don't even have a true, whatever you wanna call it, uh, yeah. a, a zeal for it. They go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just business. It's all it's all business yeah. and business yeah, it's decisions. Not the, yeah, it's the ever-changing truth. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Not the unchanging yes. truth, but ever-changing, yeah. 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 So, uh, okay. So now at this point, you know, he's in one location, you're, uh, the uh, man you're arranged to, and they've brought you back. You're communicating with him through them. Like they're, they're, they're communicating to him through you. I actually would be the, the way to phrase it. But, um, then what happens with you after all this chaos? Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I moved back into the church after just a couple days of, you know, their crazy plan. Um, you know, he blows up, he shows up to the church yelling and screaming at everybody. Um, also, this was during COVID and like Colorado was shut down. So it was just um, a very scary time. Passover was also coming up. Um, so as a member, you know, you're, you're terrified. Um, and... Yeah, I though, um, again, they didn't, um, they only got him away from me for their benefit, for their own damage control and their image. It wasn't to actually help me. And when I moved back into the church, um, it was just back to normal for them, you know, um, and I was expected to just carry on and I, and I was trying to, um, I, I didn't realize the full extent of what had just happened to me. Um, I thought that it was just the way it was supposed to be, that it was God's intention and plan for me to teach me something and, um, that it was all fine. And I, I was actually thankful to the church at the time because I thought that 
like, wow, they helped me get away from him. But looking back now, like they didn't, they didn't help me. They just did what was best for them. Um, and I started like, if you have severe trauma like that, you can't, you can only hide it up to a certain extent, you know? So looking back now, like I was having panic attacks for days on end that I, I didn't even, I didn't realize at the time, like what was going on with my body, what was going on with my mind, you know, and I'm, I'm sleeping in the same exact room where I was with him and it just expected to be okay. Um, you know, I, I used, and everything was so different. You know, we, it was COVID. We weren't out preaching every day. Um, it was just so like, it felt like it was the end. So it was kind of exciting, <laughs> but also like, it was just such a scary and unbelievable time. Um, I found myself using my violin as an outlet. I played for hours and hours, um, into late hours of the night. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to go back home and, and be in that room. Um, and, um, you know, it, it just, it started to show that I was, um, you know, I, I just had some stuff happen and I wasn't okay, but mm-hmm. that's a problem for them. You know, I, I started being questioned, like, what's wrong with you? Um, what's going on? Are you spiritually sick? Um, which wasn't the case. Like I was still bearing fruit during COVID over zoom in other States and, um, you know, having people keep the Passover, you know, conducting all of their drive through tithing and Passover stuff. I, you know, was getting more blessings. And so it was, it's like, what do you mean? Am I spiritually sick? But they, they knew that like, they knew what was going on, but they wanted to flip it on me. Um, but yeah, they made it your problem. Yeah, yeah. Opposed to the fact that like you're going through this untreated trauma that you're trying to like overcome. You're back in the same room that reminds you of all the torture you just went through. And yeah, then let's go and try to help her with it. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's still in the middle of, of COVID where a lot of people are having like a hard time in that sort of situation. <laughs> Yeah. And then I thought it was really funny that you mentioned that, like, because during COVID, it was an ever-changing um, prophecy. Because do you remember at the beginning of COVID where it was like, mother said, don't preach. And you know what that means when she says, like, don't yeah, go preaching. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we <laughs> thought that, that COVID was a sign of the end. And then, like, they were like, oh, and the last plagues you know, then there was the locust because there was like a locust uh, around. I yeah. forgot. Like oh, yeah. I remember yeah. the locust thing. Um, I think it was in Africa. Uh, no, no. It was, and it was around Pakistan. I think it went oh, through like, I think it, it traveled. Yeah. It, it went traveling. And they're like, yeah. and the next plague is darkness. And then the power of the Passover is revealed. And then it became, oh, COVID's just a disease, just like any other. And there will be even scarier disasters coming soon. So don't think that this was anything. So like it went from being like, this is the end to this is close to the end to, eh, this is just something. Yeah. But I thought it was really funny that um, you had mentioned the drive by tithing. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if people didn't ever hear about this before, but uh, during COVID, if you could explain what that, that mission of yours was. Yeah. So um you know, normally, uh, pre COVID and, you know, now post COVID times, you know, you go to three services on the Sabbath day, um, where you're expected to, um, give offering and tithe. Um, and then of course the Passover is supposed to give the biggest offering of the year. Usually it's members entire tax returns, um, cause it's tax season, right? <laughs> um, and you know, as we know, money is very important to the Wimscog. Um, so their their biggest concern um, was, you know, getting the members tithes and offerings during COVID. Obviously, um, they weren't it. They weren't actually concerned with like, are the members actually keeping the service that gives them eternal life and cleanses them are they actually doing it at home 
it was more of a, hey, come anytime. Are you, when are you going to come to bring your tithes and offering? Remember, Father, Mother will only bless you if you're tithing. You know, um, and so, yeah, they would come. Oftentimes you'd have a table set up where they would just dri- literally drive through, mm-hmm. grab, grab the envelope of money, you know, okay, bye, go away. You might have COVID. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember <laughs> we, we, we were in Maryland and they had that word. And then they, they tried to like, um, set up like tables where they'd give like little gift bags to, mm-hmm. to the members as they gave the, yeah. the tithe one, like, you know, mm-hmm. one week here and another week, another time. And the reason why they did that is because they had like the um, tech team filming everything and they wanted to make like a video of like, Oh, look what we did for our members. And, you know, created like this uh, little like propaganda video about, mm-hmm. you know, how loving and kind they are, but it's like, you set this all up and you're just collecting money from everyone. And like you arranged how the cars were going to drive in. You arranged, like it was very like produced, like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. like were they well, arranging, you go, who, you know, like were they arranging who would be like seen in the video? Like which members? They, they just got a lot cars. of footage and then they edited it, you know, yeah. however they, they wanted it. But there was definitely like, um, certain leaders that they wanted to be handing out the gift bags and um yeah. you know it, yeah covid was a weird time you know it was definitely a, a strange time because there was the big thing with shinshinji church where they were like oh, yeah. the number one spreader in korea because they didn't care about covid and like they had these mass uh and there was a big spread and then um people were getting art groups mixed up and they were thinking that it was the world mission society that caused this big COVID outbreak. So they went overboard with some of the precautions, like at least publicly, they went overboard with some of the precautions. Yeah. And I, I just had a memory come back up, um, during the beginning times of, of COVID and, and when Shinjanji was, you know, on the headlines, um, the, overseer here um she had told me like oh don't say anything but there's a couple of sisters in korea that have covid but they they're hiding them so that nobody knows because they don't they don't want you know members to lose their faith um (laughs) yeah right because uh we had the seal of god right we weren't supposed to get covid but then that quickly changed when yeah that (laughs) that was the thing i wanted to point out that was bizarre to me in that time because I I remember I don't know if I saw members posting if they were commenting on videos or if I was just hearing this from other um, members and that that was around the time I think Anthony we actually started talking you were you were reaching out to me as um, oh I can't even remember your your fake name at this point but uh, but I, I just remember hearing members you know commenting on Facebook and things like that about how oh we're we're safe and kind of this, well, you guys are all out there outside of Zion or you're going to get, get sick. You're going to get COVID, but you know, we're, we're here in Zion. We're going to be protected. Um, and so it was just this yeah. bizarre thing to me, uh, kind of seeing that go down and then knowing that, well, not only are members getting COVID like the rest of the world, but the church is having to shut down and do all these precautionary mm-hmm. measures, just like the rest of the world. And it's like, yeah. well, if, if anything about what the church says is true, I mean, why not everybody flee to Zion? We're going to stay here. We're going to be safe. This thing won't touch us. COVID really, and how that went down, how that impacted the WMS stands itself as a clear, complete refutation of of some of the fundamental doctrines of the WMS COG, um, just how it impacted the World Mission Society Church of God in the same exact way it impacts anybody else. There was nothing unique about how they experienced it, how members experienced it. They were just as subject to getting this disease as anybody else. And Mm -hmm. it's just, if you know anything about what the church teaches, uh, you know that that's a big problem. Um, And so it's just kind of always bizarre to me seeing that and just wondering why, why aren't members thinking about this? What, what's, what's keeping them from making that connection? 
well, manipulation. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Right. Well, what, what, what I think you're talking about too is uh, I think it's interesting, Esperanza, about uh, them whispering about those two members in Korea who caught it and then they were trying to like hide them. There was a post from, um, I believe it was the one who used to host the New Song Radio. There was a, a college campus radio show called New Song Radio. And they had a segment where they would just play the World Mission Society music on this like uh, college campus radio station. Mm -hmm. And um, he posted about, oh, you know, keep the Passover and you won't get COVID. Like it was some sort of post similar to that. I, I don't want to misquote it, yeah. but it was it was very much like that. And that post had to be removed, but it was screenshot. I believe it's on the examining um, the World Mission Society of Church of God um, website. Nick, okay. where Maybe we can talk, dig that uh, up. Yeah, yeah where, where it talks about that. Um, and then uh, I'm sure that that's what he had heard. And that's what he mentioned on his post. And then when that ended up obviously not being true, I'm sure he was probably like, rebuked. you know, rebuked because of posting yeah. something uh, that mother never said that. You know, yeah. they'll tell you mother said this, mother said that, but you never hear her say it. And then other times they'll say mother never said that, you know, so yeah. it, you never really know. But afterwards, members started to get it. And then it was, um, well, members won't die from it. And then members started to die from it. So, I mean, not, not, to, not to like yeah. laugh at that part, but to no. laugh at the fact no. that this is their teaching that yeah. obviously everyone's susceptible equally in mm -hmm. the church, out the church everybody's susceptible to this it's um yeah <laughs> anyway so uh esperanza yeah. um getting back to, to to your story um so now you're going through covid you're you're going through this trauma there's trying to be like you're spiritually sick even though you're succeeding in all these other metrics but like you're overcoming a lot and you're going through it alone and you know, you can't really talk to anybody about it because no one's going to really give you um, any sort of sympathy. It's going to be like, well, sister, that's your sin. You know, so there's nothing um, nothing yeah. you can really do. What's happening to you? What's what's the next? Uh... Um, yeah. And that just reminded me, too. I do want to mention I was also told I was not allowed to tell my family or anybody about my marriage. Um Hmm. Yeah. Was that before, before or after the troubles arose in the marriage? Um, I, I remember it like at the beginning of the marriage and then they had mentioned it a couple times. And there was actually a time that my dad randomly visited and he came to the church and he saw a ring on my finger and he asked about it. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I just have a boyfriend and it's just a promise ring. Um. And then I got rebuked for telling my dad I have a boyfriend. Um. <laughs> what, so why, why, why was that? Why did they, why were they so concerned with your family knowing that? Um, well, I think they know that what they're doing is wrong. And that if um, a member's family knows that they're just all of a sudden married to some random person, that it's pretty suspicious. Um, it would just bring attention to them that they don't want. Um, it's just, it's, oh, it's just so, oh, just infuriates <laughs> me. Yes. I mean, because you can see yeah. they, they have enough intuitive awareness of how, of how wrong this would look and how bad this would look to one's family. And they have the intuition to know, okay, those who care about her will be concerned about this. That doesn't lead them to step back and say, okay, what, maybe this isn't right. Maybe what we did isn't okay. But rather than that, they just, yeah. They try to protect it. They try to put shields around it. They try to try to then continue to, you yeah. know, create this know, division like, between you and your family. It's just, oh, yeah. it's just. And disgusting. and I believe, I don't I don't think that all the leaders in the church are bad. Um, a lot of them are just as brainwashed as we were, and they right. think that they're doing the right thing. Right. Um, they don't know. Um, and it, it's not an excuse at all, though, by any means. Um, doesn't make it okay. Yeah. And um, it's funny though, that like you lied to your dad for the church and then the church got mad at you, not for lying, not for lying, but for yeah. not lying well enough. Yeah. yeah. Wrong lie. Wrong lie. <laughs> um, wow. yeah. So, so, um, 
Where were so we? You, what was yeah. I? So, so, so basically, you, you brought this up about um, them telling you you can't talk to your oh, family about it. You're yeah. isolated. You're going through this um, yeah. this emotional state. And you're trying to go about being, you know, a strong gospel worker. Yeah, yeah. Despite all of this trauma that you're overcoming. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I, I really believed I couldn't tell anybody. And, and again, at that at that time, I didn't realize what had been going on. I, I thought that, uh, again, I thought this was all God and that it was okay. Um, I didn't realize how much I was actually <laughs> really struggling. Um, but mentally, it became so overwhelming um, to where I, I just needed a minute. And I one day had contacted an old friend and I, I was working remote. Um, and so I asked if I could go hang out with her, work at her house. Um, and I, I told the church that I had to go into the office that day, which some days I did. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I went to her house and it was so great. <laughs> And I, I, I just never went back to the church that night and I never said anything to anyone, you know, so I kind of ran away for a night. Um, and it, it was a, a Thursday when I did that. Um, and so the next day preparation day, you know, was like blowing up my phone. Like, are you coming for preparation day? What's going on? Like I was in so much trouble because I was, you know, like I was a very prominent member. Um, I mean, I was one of a small handful of people that were even allowed to be at the church. And I lived there during COVID. Um, so yeah, I was in a lot of trouble with them. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I was in so much, um, confusion and just I, I was not okay and I mm -hmm. I was just so afraid and I just felt that going to hell at the time would be better than being there um because you know if you have faith you believe that if you're not at Zion you're going to hell you know so so this friend to. that you went to, did you open up to her about what you went through um, or was it just really. like, Hey, I just don't, I just don't want to be alone. I just want to stay in your company tonight. Um, so she had actually come to the church a couple of times. I'd invited her okay. for study. Um, and you know, she had studied for hours and hours, but she wouldn't do it. I remember she kept service with me. And that new song, What Are We, that says we're worms. She, yeah. I remember she looked at me during that part and she was like, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, before the church, she was such a good friend. and She's a very, very good person. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I I think she she knew kind of what was going on, but she didn't she didn't say anything. Um and she, she just let me in, you know, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, and, um, yeah, there, there was, there were certain points where I would tell her like tiny little things, but I would defend the church in saying those things. I'd be like, but, you know, but it wasn't their fault, but, uh. You know. Yeah, you'd, you'd lie a little bit because you didn't want the church yeah. because you were like, if this is just a moment of weakness, I don't want to spoil her to the church. Exactly. Yeah. You wanted to protect the church's image because mm -hmm. she wouldn't get it as an outsider. But like yeah. you also you need to talk to somebody like it had to come yeah. out somehow. But yeah. it was also like you had a lie still to cover. the. I, I know exactly the situation. Yeah. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I. It, it, so that was that dynamic. She was great. Um, and then, you know, I, I left that night and then I think they saw what was going on, you know, the, like the church. Again, it was damage control for them. I ran away from a night. They knew that they had just abused the heck out of me. Um, and so they told me like, OK, well, why don't you just go live with your friend? 
And at that point, too, I just felt so like, what? <laughs> you know, um, like, if they would have just helped me, I would have never left. If they would have never put me in an, in the arranged marriage and, and or if they would have done what, what was right, I'd probably still be a member there because I believed everything so deeply. Um, so but then, they're so, yeah. They're, they're telling you to just go live with your friend. Were you receiving that as sort of like a, a punishment? Yeah, yeah. And um, I was so hurt about it. Um, I was so hurt about it. it. You feel like you're being like, kicked out of the kingdom of God. Like yeah. you think you, the lowest of yourself in that moment. And the crazy thing is, is like, none of it was my fault. Yeah. I, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't do anything to them. In fact, I did quite the opposite. And, you know, why am I being, pushed away. It's because they don't want the eyes on them. You know, um, they knew that if my situation got out, especially if I spoke out about it, it wouldn't look very good for them. Um, and, you know, knowing the way that they manipulated me um, in, in those moments of being, I, I was not in a safe position and the way that they manipulated me and didn't care about me um, and still to this day are lying to people about what happened or didn't happen. Um, yeah, I, I have to, I have to speak about it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we want to get obviously to the, what ultimately caused you to say, okay, enough is enough. I'm out of yeah. here. <laughs> and then, uh, and then also an important part of your story too, is that not only you, you left for a time and then ultimately were, um, compelled to return. Uh, which is something we want to get into, but just that that situation, real quick, um, where you you came back eventually on preparation day, right? And you were still uh, just to kind of summarize a bit. You had been traumatized by this abusive relationship with your husband. Um, how long, you know, just again to give people a bit of perspective, how long were you kind of in that trapped in that situation where you were? you were living with this man who who was just somebody that you did not want to be with initially and then found out later on, you definitely didn't want to be with him. This abusive scenario, like um, because we're, we're talking a lot about just this condition that you were in of just confusion and um, um, mm -hmm. not having any idea why, you know, not even knowing there were panic attacks, but having panic attacks. So how long did that, that go on? How long were you living in that condition with, with your husband before you ultimately were finally um, able to, to get away from him? Yeah, I was with him for a year. A year. And then it was probably, it was about like three months when I hit my breaking point after, you know, where three months where I held it together um, before okay. I just had to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so in that, there was a lot of just uh, abuse in a variety of ways. Uh, you, you mentioned he, he had a lot of times of lashing out in anger. Um, and, and I think you, you specified that he was never physically abusive necessarily. Is that correct? Um, he, he, and never again, like, say whatever you do or do not want no, to say, yeah, I don't want to yeah. push you to say. Yeah. He, he never like hit me directly with my, with his hands, but he would, um, throw things at me. Um, he would like restrain me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're dealing with all this and then you probably not even fully understanding why we're just com led to want to go. You wanted to get out of there. So you've, you, 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 went to somebody who for whatever reason you probably just felt you trusted them there was something with this former friend that you just felt safe there so you went there you came back to to on preparation day after these people are blowing up your phone where are you probably angry you know okay now there's probably rebuke coming 
And so you went back and, and you were kind of a, a mess, right? When you went back and they were talking to you, trying to figure out what was going on. So what exactly, I guess, maybe kind of paint a, a picture a bit of that situation that you were in when they, they told you, hey, just go move in with your friend, which again, if you understand what that meant as a member, they're basically saying, hey, you're no longer welcome in the kingdom of God um, and we're casting you out. So what kind of what was the state you were in um, uh, when they said that to you? Oh, I was a blob of tears. <laughs> um, yeah, I I went to the church um, that preparation day after I had running away that day before. Um, and they they just wanted to talk, they said. Um you know, and we sat down and I was confronted with what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Um, and I was just, I couldn't even speak. You know, I just uh, was crying. You know, I was so, you're so confused um, and so scared, so scared. Um, because, you know, you think that um, they, they teach you that falling away is, is your fault. Um, and it was just so like, how did I get here? How mm -hmm. am I falling away? And it was so, so scary. And looking back at that moment where I am now and knowing what I know now, it's like, how awful like how sad for you know me those years ago um like how can they be okay watching a person across from the table in that state and be okay with twisting the knife mm -hmm. you know that, yeah. that's really what it felt like um yeah so i left um, you know, they said, okay, well, you know, I was just crying. I couldn't even compose myself. Um, and they said, okay, well, maybe you should just go live with your friend. And again, like, you know, leaders are familiar with people leaving. And I'm sure they're all concerned about people speaking out, especially if they know that, you know, they were in situations like mine. And so it was just damage control. Like, oh, get her out of here before she causes a problem. And you, um, how long did they give you? And did, cause you know, that's a big imposition for your friend. Like you spent the night, but like, you know, did your friend say, Hey, if you need to move into my apartment or my home, like it's open to you. Like, what, thankfully, what, yeah, did, I'm, I'm so thankful because, um, my friend, like, it was a, a house that she was renting with another friend, and there were, like, two other, two or three other open bedrooms. And so I was able to just talk to their landlord and move in that next day. So they gave you no time, really? No. Like, they took and away your, your independence. They had you move in, and now they have your, your home under their control. Like During they, COVID. <laughs> During COVID, yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's absolutely like you know, and and that's what they do. They they like to take as much control over you as possible. And now, like your living conditions are under their control. I mean, yeah. it's like I look at these overseers who like they don't have anything on their resume besides this church, who's not going to be a reference if they ever leave. Their car, their cell phone, like their home, like everything is by the church. Like mm -hmm. they're they're stuck. They have nowhere to go, even if they stop leaving and they feel completely abused and, you know, they know that this church is full of lies, where are they going to go? And I, I, they just make it more and more difficult the more you let them take of your life. And, uh, and it's not let, but, you know, the more you're coerced to give up your independence to them, the more mm -hmm. stuck you become. Like on the East Coast, there used to be this expression, no safety net, meaning like yeah. if you have a way to leave. If you have like a home to go back to, if you have uh, the ability to leave without going homeless, you know, then that means you're sinning. Like you mm -hmm. need to be all into the church without an escape route for yourself. 
Like yeah. that's the way that they say you have to conduct your life of faith. Of it took course. me a year to build up my, my safety net. It took me a while to like figure out how to leave. But yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now yeah. they, they kick you out of the church to live. Are you allowed to still participate? Um, yeah, I was just told like, oh, now you're just going to be a regular member. Mm -hmm. You know, position gone, um, blessings gone. You're just a regular member now, but you can still go to heaven if you just keep service. And that was so, in that moment, that was so contradictory because as you know, um, as you continue with the church and, mm -hmm. um, you know, get more blessings and get position, um, you're told that there, there is no other option. Yeah. But if you, if you start doing less than you did before, like you can't go backwards, you're not really going to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like, is it okay? It's not okay. According to their teaching. You yeah, know? because you also know that they tell people, oh, just keep the Passover, you'll go to heaven. Like that's, yeah. you, you know, sometimes they'll just say things yeah. to comfort people, mm -hmm. even though like, you know, that's not what they really believe. Yeah. yeah. So they're telling you, oh, all you have to do is just keep these services. You'll, you'll go to heaven. Even though you lose all these blessings, you'll still go. You feel like, are they just saying to me what they say to everybody when they know that what they tell everybody else is like not true? Yeah. Because you know, it, it definitely feels like even though they say it, they don't really mean it. You just feel like you've been kicked so far down that they say like this little bit like is enough. And you know that that's not really how they feel. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it was um, it, it felt so like emotionally painful to try and just keep service at home by myself in my little bedroom, trying to hide it from my new roommates who are in the world, you know, um, mm -hmm. it was terrifying. And I felt like, you know, like we talked about, according to what they teach, like you feel like what, what's the point now? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm probably going to hell anyway. Um, so yeah, and then I then commenced my like just trying to throw myself back into the world and pretend like I was okay, not telling anybody that any of this had ever happened. Um I, you know, got a second job. Um and I was just, you know, I kind of like tagged along with my friend, whatever she was doing. I was like, okay, cool. I you had a support that. system right there that, that at least yeah, you had that. Yeah. And I, I'm grateful for that, but it was, um, you know, though I, though I was out, you know, my mind was still there. Um, because I never, I never, I never wanted to hold them accountable for what they did. Um, because I didn't want the church to look bad. I was still defending them. I thought that they were true still. I thought that it was just a one-off situation um, and I hoped that, you know, at, while I was away that time, I, I was going about living life pretending I was okay. Um, but each and every day, like I would still look up at the sky and talk to An Sang Hong. And, um, you know, even when the COVID vaccine came out, I, I didn't know what to do, whether to get it or not to get it. And then I, um, I was talking with a, a member and she said, oh, mother said that the vaccine is good. So that I got the vaccine that week. Um, so you're yeah, still like, getting your guidance from, from the yeah, church, like even though you're out. Yeah. yeah. So but, I, I wasn't, I wasn't actually out. I wasn't living my life. Um, you know, I, I let them. I let them make me believe that um, that all of this was my fault mm -hmm. and that I was just going to go to hell, you know, just hoping that I would have a chance, even though like there, I, there's nothing that I, I didn't do anything wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
And so some time goes on. It, it was about a year that I was out like that. You know, I had gone to Germany and was just like pretending like I was living life. Um, and yeah, then, you know, they found out that I worked at this second job. It was a bakery and they kept showing up there. Um, they kept visiting me. They, you know, would text me all the time. Um, and I, I was just so afraid too, because I knew that the person they had partnered me with, um, that he was still there. And I was so terrified of him. Um, like at one point, uh, he apparently was driving for Uber Eats. Um, and we did Uber Eats at the bakery I worked at. And he came in the door to do his delivery or whatever. Oh my God, I hit the floor so fast behind that bakery counter and I just, whole body is shaking. Uh, I mean, I, I was terrified of this person. And, and after all the, the things that he did to you, criminal things he's done, he's still just, you know, allowed to just participate in the church. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, this so, is, this is one of our, this is a chosen yeah. person of God. This yeah. is, this is the Royal priesthood right here. <laughs> this, yeah. You know. And, you know, also like they make you feel responsible, not only for your own salvation, but the salvation of everyone around you. And so even though this person had been so awful and terrifying, like I was still so concerned for his salvation and I thought that if I went back, then he would leave and go to hell. And then I would end up being punished and going to hell anyway, because I killed him spiritually. You know, um, mm -hmm. it sounds so crazy, but this is what they teach that like yeah. anything you say or do can spiritually kill someone. And then the blood of that person is on your hands. So, you know, that's something that kept me away for some time too. And then also thinking about like, you know, I was such a, a so active member when I was there, like there wasn't a thing that I wasn't doing and then to leave and then go back. I thought about like, Oh, what if, you know, the members in my unit see me, you know, and if they ask why, where was I, why did I leave? Like, it's going to hurt their faith. And then, you know, what if it kills them spiritually too? So I thought it was just better if I, like, I thought I was saving people by not being there. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but, you know. So your your whole life is just being driven and determined by fear. Really, fear of hell is like the foundation of all the decisions you're making and the decisions most members make. But yeah. it's, it's crazy that even with a year of being outside, living with people on the outside who have no probably even awareness really of, of the church and what it teaches you're around these people, you're traveling to Germany, but still that, that doctrine has been so deeply in, embedded in you that you're making all these decisions uh, based on that, that fear of hell for yourself and for other people. It's just, mm -hmm. it's tragic. Yeah, it, it's so crazy. And I was, I was, protecting the church even in that moment that I hit the floor having an attack because he had walked in the door my co-workers were like oh my god what is going on because I was always just the like bubbly happy you know working hard and all of a sudden I'm this like fragile yeah. mess on the ground um mm -hmm. and I I just I didn't know what to say I was like oh that guy used to stalk me and I told the owner, like, can you let me know if he comes here? Like, I was so afraid of him. Um, but yeah. And then also like during this whole time, like he was making it impossible to divorce him. Um, he was just being difficult, refusing to participate. Um, so I was really struggling with that. Um, you know, so you were still married at that time. Yeah. <laughs> like it was just always hanging over me. Um, and so, yeah, members kept coming and visiting me at the bakery, um, just like clockwork. And um, an older member came by herself at one point, and I 
Um, I felt comfortable with her and I just for the first time told someone else what actually happened. I said, Hey, they set me up with this brother and the marriage was really bad and I'm afraid of him and I'm trying to get this divorce done and I don't know what to do. And the war with the Russia and Ukraine had just popped off. I was terrified um, thinking that like the world's about to end. Like I have to figure out a way to go back. Um, so yeah, new overseers had come, had come. She had connected me with him. We met, he did help me get this brother to um, cooperate um, this time, which I was thankful for. Um, and I went fully back into the church, a hundred percent back in, um, I moved, um, I sold most of my furniture, like everything I had acquired during that year away. I like sold it all. I went back. Cause again, it was like, oh, this war is happening. The world's about to end. I'm going back to Zion. And if I'm going back, I'm going back. Like, I'm not going to be, Wait, you know, you didn't move back in or did you? No, no. I just okay. moved to a house closer with the church um, okay, cuz I okay. I had moved far away to like prevent Distance yourself so you didn't that. see members at the mall and at the Walmart yeah. and <laughs> yeah okay so I, yeah and I, I hear you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I hear that um cuz yeah there's no privacy if they have any of your information they'll find you um so yeah I I immediately just jumped up and moved back closer to the church um you know, I gave up a big job opportunity that would have changed my life so that I could keep the humble little job I had so I could give all my time to the church again. Um, yeah, preaching every day, immediately tithing. Um, I went back about a month before the Passover of 2022. And um, that Passover was very interesting. Um, because I had been back for about a month. I was tithing, offering. I was preaching every day. I was redoing all the studies. Um, and then I was told I wasn't allowed to keep first Passover because I had left, but that I if I was good and I kept tithing and kept doing these things, then I could keep second Passover. Special rules, special punishments yep. for individual um, people. You know, so of course I, I still go and like to the Passover service, but during the time of actually, you know, receiving the blessing of the bread and the wine, I, I'm there with my head down and I don't want to be seen, but there's, two sisters next to me who I haven't seen in years. Yeah. Who've never been very active members. Hearing them chomping on that Passover bread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, here, here, and here here you are like trying to get back yeah. in, into it and being just, told that this is like the biggest day of the year. This is your salvation. This is becoming one with God. This is the seal of God. This is everything. And you have to keep your head down and watch everybody around you. I've never seen anybody go to the Passover without participating in the Passover. It's, it's, that's like, I've yeah. never seen that. that I've was never torture. seen somebody because that's torture. Yeah, it, it really was. I, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, all the thoughts are running through your mind. Like what if the world ends before a second Passover? Like, yeah. and, and again, it was the, I think it was the, um, just turning it, everything that they did back on me to make me feel yeah. like it was my fault, that I'm the mm -hmm. sinner, that I deserved these things. It is um, amazing. So, I, um, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, if I could just interject real quick, because this is just to me is <clears throat> what a perfect example of like the contrast between what, um, biblical Christianity would 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 look like in this instance, what it should look like and what the WMS COG does in their complete deviation from it. I mean, it's, I just immediately think of like the prodigal son uh, 
story that Jesus tells, where he talks about the father who, whose son, I mean, if you understand the cultural implications of what the son did in that instance, it's basically the son saying to the father in, in asking for his inheritance, saying, I wish you were dead. You know, it's just a, a slap in the face. It's just something that warranted the community stoning that son to death. So the son goes mm -hmm. out, lives, you know, wastes his money on prostitutes and all sorts of things comes back to the father has this speech prepared to, to kind of explain uh, and, and, you know, show his remorse. And the father doesn't even let him get through his speech. He just throws his hand around him, kisses him, throws the robe on him, gives him immediately restores him, not only restores him right back to where he was before, but gives him even more says, Hey, bring out the fatted calf. And just, it, it's just a picture of how, you know, God is not this, retributive you know vengeful if somebody does something wrong i my goal is just to get them back and to give them what they deserve it's just all he the father just wanted the son home he just wanted the son yeah. home and safe and and the moment the son stepped foot back back where he was supposed to be father was like you're you're home the, the son said make me like one of your hired servants he's saying make me I, I don't expect to be at the same position I was before. And the father was like, he just ignored it. It's like, that's nonsense. You're my son. That's who you are. You're back. And so what, man, what a, this is, this people, this is mother's love right here. Everything <laughs> you're describing. This is mother's love. You know, you have this woman who's been abused in, in, in so many ways and, and is just in such confusion and despair comes back to the church crying doesn't even have words to express all the things going on these people saying what's you know i am just picturing back in that that scenario where you're sitting across the desk from these people you'd been gone from the church for a day and they're saying where were you what's wrong you're crying you can't even get words out their response to that isn't to sit back and say man she's hurting what she's not doing okay what can we do to let's just give her some time let's but let's let's figure out what something something's causing her pain. Let's figure that out. Instead, like you said, they saw that knife sticking in you, and they said, "Here's what we're going to do. Let's grab onto that thing. Let's twist it around, and let's let's just make it let's make it worse. Let's make it to where actually that that's going to get infected now. Let's make, let's tell her that because of this situation, because you're not able to explain in your pain what's going on." Well, let's just tell her. Well, now you're going to go to hell. Now you're you're kicked out. Just go live with your friend. Um, that that is mother's love. And now you finally you, they convince you to come back. And now they're like, oh yeah, you can come back. But guess guess what? You can't. This eternal life that we're all eating, this thing that's keeping you from a fiery eternal torment in hell. Well, you can't you can't have that because of what you did. And you need you need to know. It's kind of like we're going to rub you your nose at it. <laughs> yeah. You can watch you can watch us have it and like you said they're the ones who caused all of that in the first place that i mean everything that you experienced and all the you never did any i can't not one thing that you've told in the story is like <laughs> you didn't do anything wrong not not one time you were you were the one mistreated and and victimized in all these scenarios and yet they turn around and they just they punish you for it they punish you for the pain uh, of the abuse that they caused in the first place. And it, it is just, it's mind blowing. It's, it's like you're, I just, uh, that room, that scenario of you weeping in this room, not able to get out words and you're surrounded, you know, you've had, had these people questioning you. It's like, you're surrounded by sociopaths. Like this, this group just creates sociopaths, people who are just not, they're just so out of touch with, reality because again not like you said earlier not all these people are, are bad people I, I mean I don't know who was in that room with you. I don't know who was making these decisions but they you know in many ways they've been victimized as well that again like you said that doesn't excuse in any way what what they did but it's just the the entire system and culture that is being described in your story so clearly that's being communicated in, in how they responded to you. I mean, so, so many similarities to um, in, in some ways to Corey's story and, mm -hmm. and how she was treated 
just being being punished for her experience, basically being abused and then punished when she was just experiencing the pain of that. It's just there. There really there are not words to express how horrific and horrible it is that this organization with power over these people that that's what they do with that power it is they they yeah it, it's just it's just terrible i'm just so saying sorry i know doesn't do anything but i it just truly am sorry for for you and all the other members who have had to experience this and then and then to to still, I know, still, even at this point in your story, I'm sure you're still thinking so you're you're being your your thought process is still in some way probably this is my fault, this is what I deserve. Where have I, you know, it, you you just kind of receive it, you receive it because you're taught, you've been trained to just take that punishment, to get punched in the face and kicked around. And to think, oh well, this is this is what's supposed to happen. Here, here, hit me again. Here, hit me again. Um, and yeah, I, I'm so sorry. And this is this is why we make these videos because this is just disgusting. World Mission Society, Church of God, you you guys are disgusting. This is this is ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? You can't do this. You can't treat people like this. Like, what are you doing? You have to change. Uh, th this is this is not okay. Yeah. Sorry, this is my my yeah, rant, but no. I, I, it's just <laughs> this, is, this is mother's yeah. love being being described here, and it's it's horrible. It's evil. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very evil. Um, yeah, like I said, especially now being out, knowing what I know, and just looking back on all these moments where I was very deeply manipulated, taken advantage of. Um, being made out to nothing um all for lies you know for um you know financial gain for them to feel powerful whatever it is um yeah uh but i i'm i've now i've learned you know the the tactics that were used so that you know, they can never do that to me again. And not yeah, only you, that, I can talk about it. Yeah, because when you first left, you didn't yeah. you didn't realize, you know, you you left with this um with this situation that like if you were there, people are gonna ask you about what happened, and then that's gonna cause them to view because what can you say? If you tell them the truth, they're gonna be like, Oh. Maybe yeah. the church isn't good. And you felt like guilty for that. You know, if you went back and then, you know, your ex felt uncomfortable, he might leave. And then you'd feel guilty for that. And, you know, it's just like such a bad, and you left in the wrong way. You left believing, you left still feeling like I'm condemning myself to hell, but you know, what other choice do I have at the moment? Yeah, And you, so now I understand because I always am curious because we know we've seen we've seen people who leave and then come back and leave and come back and there's always like a stigma attached to them you know like oh this is the one oh who left you know how how could they do so how could they turn their back to God like that and you know no matter what like even if you try to be you know fine with them as a member to member um, there's always some members are always going to treat you a little bit differently. And you know that because you've seen it and you've witnessed it and you've heard, you know, members talk about members who leave and come back. And now you're putting yourself in those shoes, humbling yourself in that way to know that people are going to be judging you the minute you walk through the door and still doing it, still coming back, still submitting yourself to, preaching and all like jumping right back in and then they still don't let you do it but they keep other people it's just ridiculous yeah. the way that they treated you so and then, and then they want to say that i didn't have faith <laughs> yeah yeah like if you didn't yeah. have faith you would have never subjected yourself to coming back and knowing what it is like and how people view somebody who left and came back like yeah. to do that honestly takes 
a lot of faith because once you leave, it's just so much easier just to stay out. But to come back again, mm -hmm. that means you really like you really feel like you need it because otherwise you would never put yourself through that sort of uncomfortable social setting. Mm -hmm. So you come back and you have to miss the first Passover. Eventually, obviously, you, this uh, this reunion with the church doesn't doesn't last forever. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the next round for you? Um, yeah. So I, like I said, when I went back, I went back and I was doing again, they, they owned me again. <laughs> um, and you know, every opportunity that they presented, I took it. Um, and I was just trying to, you know, make up for lost time and try to, try to get to heaven in time. And, um, you know, also I'm expected to be in the same room on multiple occasions with, you know, the guy they partnered me with. And, um, that was very difficult. <laughs> I got pretty good at hiding the shakes. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, there were lots of things that happened when I went back, um, but, uh, you know, I, the thing that got me out, out was, uh, they sent me on a, a short-term preaching trip to Utah, to Mormonville, USA, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, uh, yeah, we got there and were given a briefing on Mormonism. And, you know, they say, um, you know, the Mormon church treats women terribly. They just see them as, you know, producers of children and that's it. And just helpers to their husband and that's it. And, um, you know, they don't get to choose their husbands and, um, just, you know, all these things that were paralleling my story. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, am I in a cult? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was terrifying. And then during that trip, I started noticing things that I didn't really notice before. Um, when it comes to, um, coercion, um, just the, the ways that we were taught to preach in a manipulative way. Mm -hmm. um, like very specifically, um, these are my notes that I took from that briefing. Um, yeah, this is July of 2022. <laughs> uh, we were told that the, the Mormons, um, if they were very active in the Mormon church, that they would just be a time wasting demon. Mm -hmm. Um, because, and now looking at that, uh, I get why they said it, because um, they're, they were doing what we were also doing. Um, there's not a single thing that they didn't have an answer to, and us as well, because we're both cults. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, if we try to just continuously use each other's tactics against each other all day, we're going to get nowhere. And so that's why they say, oh, it's a time-wasting demon. So they told us, like, okay, when you're out there preaching and you run into members of the Mormon church, ask them questions to try to figure out how active they are um, or if they've left, um, you know, which is code for, like, is this person in a vulnerable position or not, and can we get them? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that that's one thing I noticed. Um, and... Then we had a, um, so here in this region of the, the Wimscog, Utah, um, the Salt Lake location, they're known for their, um, like all the publicity that they've gotten, like going on the news and all their community service that they do. Um, and before I went, the overseer here in Colorado Springs said, oh, hey, like, you know, talk with them, ask them, you know, how they got their awards that they have. Um, how they get so many community service events that they do. Um, yeah, so I went there and they actually gave us a, a training on all of it. And that was very interesting. And that's where they just outwardly said, um, 
because they had the the president's award for community service, um, but in the in the church name for that specific location in Utah. And they specifically said like, oh yeah, like you don't actually have to do the work to get that. Like it's not real from the president. Like they literally just said, we just applied for it and we got it. That's it. And then, um, you know, they also said like within their community that they just um, would search for awards that were available within the community and just apply for them. And they were like, and sometimes there's like not really a lot of uh, applicants. So we just will get random awards. And then they have this huge wall with all these random awards. And so when people come, they're like, oh, look at our church. And then they can... And then Utah's interesting too because um, you know it has a very deep history of Mormonism, especially when it comes to like leadership in the community politics. Um, and so, like, it can be hard for another religion to have validity in the community. So they think that having all those awards helps them in that specific setting too. So um, that just was so like come on guys. <laughs> um, they even said, and this one, I was like, oh my gosh. They said that, um, they're like, yeah, you can even just like mock up an award, you know, like create one of your own and present it to them and see if they'll sign it. Um, so that was my first, uh, encounter with realizing that most all of the awards that the church has are fake. <laughs> And they did not actually earn them. Um, so that was that was eye opening to me. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, mostly, you know, I. Um, one thing that was interesting, too, is they said that, you know, the Mormons knew about Heavenly Mother and her existence yeah. in heaven. And yeah, they've been very, talking about that longer than. Yeah, actually, there, yeah. there's um, they, they actually put out something recently. I think Jordan, uh, you may have seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, from the Mormon I did, Church. yeah. Yeah, you, you submitted. Uh, it. Steve sent that to me. That that was actually I I never knew that was a part of Mormon doctrine. But but that, yeah. yeah, yeah, they they have they have a a, a, a doctrine of a, a mother God that we have a mother in heaven who we're going to go and, and be with, which, which to me yeah. that when I found that out, I think it was just last week, that was uh, kind of a moment of, well, that's, you know, this seems like a pretty significant problem yeah. for the WMS because they have, they've had it longer, longer than yeah, the WMS. Has. Yeah. Much They're longer. the ones who, yeah. So if this is true, on Song Hong, he's not the one who, Revealed yeah. mother. Yeah, he never really was. was <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, right. He wasn't. Anyways. And then you feel yeah. Kim kind of copied her notes, but right. Yeah. So um, but yeah, that in in that moment though, before I started doing my research, it just was interesting to me because it was like, wait, I thought we were the only church that had the truth of mother. Um. So you know, it kind of had my gears turning. Um, and so I came back from that trip in Utah. Um, when I got back that following Sabbath, they had promoted, um, the guy they had arranged me to, you know, knowing everything that they did, they promoted him. Um, and then the next day I found out about a death in the family out of state. Um, and so that was my out. I was like, all right. I got to go figure this out. So I drove out of state, went to my family function, and I started researching. Um, first, just the Mormon church. I wanted to know more. I was curious. I started um, hearing, listening to ex-Mormon stories. Um, and then, you know, stories from other, you know, high control religious cults. <laughs> And I was seeing that um, there wasn't anything different from my experience to theirs. It was all the same, the way they were brought in, the way they were manipulated, the way 
they were ostracized, the way they, how deeply they believed, um, how good of people they were, yeah. and that there wasn't anything wrong with them, that it wasn't their fault, but it was just the, the group that they were in that inflicted this abuse and control. And so, yeah, then, you know, read Steve Hassan's book. Then we advanced to Great Light Studios. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rest was history. But, you know, then I started learning, um, gosh, the, I, I remember, um, you know, when you read Steve Hassan's book, Combating Cult Mind Control, um, and he, he shares his story. I was like, wait a minute, was this guy in the same church? You know, South Korea. Yeah. And all the things he was saying, I was like, wait, no, we say that. I was like angry. I was like, why is this guy stealing? Like, he, why is this church stealing our stuff? Come to find out they were doing that before the wind dog. Like yeah. nothing that the World Mission Society Church of God teaches is original to them. They've just made it up. They've pulled it from other cults and put it together and yeah. honestly it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah as i call um, the frankenstein yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bits and pieces of all these and they create a monster yeah, yeah. and yeah. and of course like what i do want to say is like in those moments of my research i didn't want any of it to not be true i wanted the church to be mm -hmm. right because i believed it so deeply so deeply and it's so hard, it's so hard to admit that everything you believe in is fake. It's so hard to admit that you were abused, that you were lied to. It's so hard, like just an indescribable feeling, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, you know, in continuing to research, I realized like, all right, I need to, I need to face these things. This happened. And now I'm going to learn what they did to me. I'm going to try my best to psychologically undo it. Very, very difficult. Um, and that's when I realized like, it's not just manipulation. It's, it, it, it's very deep brainwashing. And, um, they completely had us in a state where we were outside, living outside of our body. You know, we weren't allowed mm -hmm. to feel emotion. We weren't allowed to have our own thoughts. Um, and later when I learned that that is a cult tactic used for brainwashing to strip you of yourself, it just, um, gosh, you feel so lost. Um, and coming out and, and doing that work um, of trying to figure all that out, it's so hard, <laughs> but it, I, I, I feel like it's, um, you know, if you've, if you, someone has, you know, just recently left the church or is thinking about leaving, and you're having these feelings of extreme fear and not like trusting yourself and you're thinking that your thoughts are coming from Satan, just know that those are cult tactics of brainwashing and manipulation. It's not you, you know? Um, you know, the, the, the deep fear that's put in you it was all intentional. You know, it's not, God, I, w I wish I would have known that. You know, I, I never would have went. Yeah. It's not unique to this church alone. Yeah, it's not. Every cult member who leaves feels exactly that sort of way. Yeah. Where, like, they don't trust their own thoughts anymore. When they're leaving and they realize all these things are bad, it's not, like, an influence from Satan. It's not your demonic you know, uh, spirits. It's not uh, the fact that you sinned in heaven. That's why you feel this way. No, it's every single cult group. You leave it, 
you feel the exact same feelings that you are feeling when you leave the World Mission Society. Like yeah. and, it's, and it's all the same. It's the same right. structure. They, they copy each other's methods. And it's important. It's not only, I think, the fear that, that they all feel coming out of this and that, that confusion, but it's also what you pointed to earlier, that sense of, of I don't want this to not be true. You know, that, that sincere, you know, that's something that I, I, you know, came face to face with that really challenged me over the past decade is coming face to face with Mormons or other people who are just so devoted to, to, their conception of, of God and, and the Bible even, uh, and, and you kind of get, you know, not only cult groups do this, but there's, there's streams within evangelicalism that, that can create this us versus them. And I don't, I'm not speaking to necessarily how that, that all of evangelicalism does that, but that does that, that can happen in, I think an unhealthy way to where then when you come face to face with somebody like a Mormon and you see, you know, I remember sitting down on a couch and having a Mormon just explaining to me this this guy who's just the, the sweetest, most sincere person I've ever met talking about their love for Jesus and their love for Jesus as Jesus is my savior and he, he's everything to me. He's all that matters. In my, and that just things like that just hit me like, wait a minute. They're they that's how I talk. Like That's what is that? How does that court like that just it, it creates this like you know confusion and 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 um so many questions that arise from that but i think it's in, important that people recognize that especially in situations like this with the wms who just shouts and, and propagates that we are the only true church we are unique nobody has doctors like this nobody can 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 teach the bible in the way we do um, and then you just look over and you see that, wait a minute, this, this person over in that group, they're feeling the same things. They have the same devotion. They have the same fears. They're going through the same things that I am. So where does that leave me now? How, how can I, how can I say that my, you know, my construct of, 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 you know, God and all these things, how can I say that's, true and they're not like what 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 mm -hmm. ammunition am i left with now and I, I just think that's something that i would hope people would 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 consider um as they're hearing this story that you can consider that and let that lead to <laughs> questions um i think questions are are good i think that you know using our our intellect um and rationality reason these are things that are I, I think God gives us as protective mechanisms to to defend us from garbage. And there, there are signals that say, hey, wait, something's not right here. And it's easy when you are in a, a very, you know, closed construct uh, that kind of, when you are in this a system that has kind of boxed in everything. We've got all the information. We know everything there is to know about the Bible and God. And that out there is bad. This in here is good when you face those things, you're, you're just kind of, you know, and you're existing in this box, you're just set up for like a, uh, what do you call that? Like a, uh, not a, 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 just a crisis, a crisis of faith. Uh, um, and so, yeah, but, but I think that's, that's interesting that you were, you were encountering that, but that actually was one of the things that allowed you to, to say, okay, I think maybe I can, Maybe I can yeah. let this go. Maybe I can walk away from this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, but when I walked away too, um, cause I, when I, when I'd come back from out of state, I actually went and confronted the, uh, overseer here. Um, you know, of course I was told like, I need to pray more. I need to read these verses, blah, blah, blah. Took no accountability. Um, you know, said, oh, sister, do you need us to move this brother to another location so you can be okay? And it was like, no, I need you guys to stop abusing people and lying about it. Um, you know, like, oh, you're kind of acting like the Catholic church now, huh? <laughs> Just shipping your abusers around. Um, and, and I, it's exactly what I said to him. Um, but yeah, I, I got my stuff and I left and I, I never went back, but it was very difficult um, 
because the first time, like I, like, yeah, I ran away that night, but then I was also kind of kicked out and like, I really wanted to go back, you know, and I, and I did, but this time, like I was starting to realize some things and it was my choice to actually leave and sep- try to separate myself from the church. And, you know, as I'm starting to learn all of these, um, you know, cult education and the tactics that were used and starting to try to unpick the doctrine, I want, I still wanted to go back. And I, it was for months. I, I had to fight it because, and I, I know now what it was, um, like cults, um, cult leaders, they know what they're doing. They know the human mind and how it works and that the human, our minds are designed to protect us, um, to keep us alive. And so they get us in a state where we believe that the only way we can be safe and stay alive is by being there and doing what they say. And, um, you know, we're told what to wear, what to eat what not to wear or eat, when to sleep, how much to sleep, how much not to sleep, for sure. Um, You know, who we're allowed to, everything is completely dictated to where you are completely dependent on them. And so when you leave all of that, there's a lot of things going on psychologically that at the time I really didn't understand. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I was able to eventually understand and, and not go back. But, um, Again, your brain is just trying to protect you. And so like, um, even still now to this day, like I have a hard time actually like feeling really connected and present where I'm at, like participating in a fun activity with friends or whatever it might be. You know, I I don't feel like I'm really feeling um, as connected to life as I used to before the cult and all this happened. And I, I've, I've learned some things in that and, and looking back at, you know, that, that place I was where I, I was literally laying in bed, like fighting, just not getting in my car and driving to, back to the church and saying, just kidding, I'm back. <laughs> um, but, you know, our, our brains found safety in being there. It was the most safe place we could be on earth. And you know, sometimes, you know, and, and you're fighting that when you come out because you're, you, of but course, you're, the illusion of safety. That's yeah, exactly. what it was. But it, it, it wasn't actually literally the yeah, safest place. It, it was, was intentionally created in your mind yeah. by them to think that the unsinkable ship, like the safety. Titanic, you know, you, yeah. you feel so safe on that boat, but <laughs> yeah, it actually, so, you know, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, um, um, you know, just fighting that and realizing that, you know what, actually, I'm safe outside of that place where nobody's going to lie to me. And um, to the point of, you know, manipulating me that deeply, nobody's going to put me in an arranged marriage and abuse me. Um, They're not going to take my money, which at one point they told asked me like, Oh, well, just give us your entire paycheck and we'll give you a monthly allowance to just pay your bills. You know, like they, it's a hundred percent control. Um, and so, you know, I, if, if anyone, you know, just speaking to anyone who is struggling with that right now, like thinking of going back and feeling afraid, just please know that that fear was intentionally instilled in you and hold on to the things that you know, that are true. Um, like, the lies that they're telling if you've, you know, researched at all, you know, for me, it was, um, I didn't, you know, you don't have all the answers right away, right away. When you leave, you're scared. You're, you're like, okay, well, where do I go? No other church keeps yeah. the seven feet. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You know, Probably you're so the afraid. Number one question I get. Yeah. You're like, where do one. I go? But, um, you know, the one thing about high control religious cults is they 
claim to give you an answer for everything. And just know you don't have to have an answer for everything, but you do need to like protect yourself. And if you're, if you're questioning it and it keeps coming up, that's your, that's your gut and your intuition. And that's God given. It's not Satan. You know, the church telling you that these doubts and everything are Satan. It's just a cult tactic. They're trying to stop your Mm -hmm. thoughts. Your, your, um, who you are as a person and your um, intuition, it's, it's God given, you know, and there's a reason that it keeps coming up. So, you know, listen, um, listen to those things and hold on to them. You know, for me, it was like, I couldn't, though I didn't have all the answers. I was like, well, you know, um, I, I couldn't get over how the church lied about, well, first of all, how they changed the the name of the church a few times, you know, because they have that study, the church bought with God's own blood. And they say, well, our name is the church of God. So that's reason number one, why we're the church, true church. And it's like, well, that hasn't always been your name. Um, And then how they lied on their um, tax exemption when they came to the United States about the doctrine of the church saying that, you know, it was Ju Chol Kim that had this vision. They said nothing about An Sung Hong or God the Mother. Um, just lies like that. And then, of course, the the things when it came to the community service and seeing how, how fake it was. Um, those were the little things that I had to... And then, of course, like my own abuse that I experienced. But those were the little things that I had to keep reminding myself of. And those moments of like, you know, are they right? Should I go back? what do I do? Where do I go? I had to keep, just keep reminding yourself, hold on, you know, to the things that you do know and hold on to yourself because, um, you know, you're, you're not a bad person. You're not wrong for, for questioning things. You know, the truth can always be proven true. And you'll find that the more you research this church and try to prove it to be true, you'll see the exact opposite. Um, And you'll find that, you know, your, your intuition is true. Um, And, and that's what you should go with. Um, So, uh, yeah, I think those were some very important things that I wish I would have um, known, you know, when I first ran away and was really struggling and it would have saved me a lot of money, uh, effort, you know, I, I'd be well, way more well off with my career and other things um, if I wouldn't have gone back um, for that time. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, you, it was, uh, that was a lot of truth you just dropped. For, for me, what I feel like is really interesting is the fact that there were times that you felt like you wanted to return back to the church Mm -hmm. and it's um i think that there's what you were mentioning about the brainwashing is the environment that they put you in they give you all the answers you don't need to have free thought like you know exactly you know somebody else tells you you don't have to make these decisions they're being made for you when you leave and you're it's kind of like um you almost lose that ability to be an independent person and make your own choices. So it's a very strange feeling to go back and be autonomous. Yeah. Um, You know, adjusting back to the world where you're in control of your life and your choices. And there's nobody telling you, you know, Oh, you want to go visit your family? Well, let's see if you're able to, what dates do you need? Where's the location? What's the, this fill out this form. And we'll tell you what churches you're allowed to go visit. You know, there's no, I'm thinking about changing my job. I'm thinking, but you know, they would, you'd have to sit down and have meetings about these things and they would tell you whether it was okay or not. You want to have one of your church members, you know, get a job with you. You'd have to sit down and talk to the leader and see whether or not it was okay. You want to move in with somebody. You want to date somebody. Of course not. You know, it's, yeah. It's every everything that yeah. you know, now you have to make these choices and it's hard to do 
once you've not had this responsibility for a while. And I can see that being also a temptation is like, it's tough. Life can be tough. And, yeah. you know, even though you weren't safe in that environment, like you knew how to exist in that environment. But yeah. Um, yeah. And um, one thing regarding that, that, um, you know, looking back, it's like, wow. <laughs> um, when I went back to the church, when I went to service again for the first time, I felt this just like release where I just completely let go. And in the moment, of course, I was still so brainwashed. I was like, oh, wow, the peace of being with father and mother again, you know, but actually I just wasn't fighting in my brain anymore, you know, because mm -hmm. now, I'm, now I'm back in this environment where I don't even have to think about what to wear because I'm told what to wear and that's easy. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to think about what to eat because that's taken care of too. I don't have to think about what I'm going to be doing with my free time because, you know, that's taking mm -hmm. care of too. Like you're, you don't have to make any decisions anymore. And yeah. there can be, you know, life is stressful and stuff. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when you're, you're so brainwashed and then you, you leave and then you go back into that environment, of course, like there, I experienced just this, this release of like, just letting go and letting them take complete control again. And at the time I thought it was, I believed it was like, I trust that this is God and I have faith. And I, and it felt like um, the path of God is the, the right path. And at the time I thought that was in the world mission society, church of God. And I went back and so, and I just completely let them have me again. But now I realized like, Oh, you know, like you, you come out and you're like a, a, a child again. You don't know yeah. how to make your own decisions. And, and so then you go back and it seems easier. It, it does, it, but well, it's not the right thing to do. <laughs> isn't there a parallel perhaps between that and, you know, you'll have uh, people who have been incarcerated for 10 or 20 years and who get released That's true. and and many of them want to return like they'll go and and pur purposely commit a crime that will get them sent back because that's that's yeah, where they're they like, find I comfort. In jail. yeah and so <laughs> i just i, I, I just want to <laughs> <laughs> i just want to say that because some some members will hear what you just said and say oh you see you see zion <laughs> is the place where god is and she <laughs> she found she was finding peace again but it's like well no you could no. you could find <laughs> that experience in a pokemon yeah. club or something i mean it's just yeah. that's just it has nothing to do with the yeah. truthfulness of the organization. It's just, uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I say all of this response. because, yeah. And I, and I say all of this because, um, I wish I would have known that it wasn't, um, it wasn't the peace of God overcoming me, you know, mm -hmm. in that moment, it was the subjection to brainwashing. Mm -hmm. Can, can I also, um, uh, very interesting. Mention, um, that the other thing is the way that we're judged in life versus how we were judged in the church are two different sorts of things. Like sometimes like now in my life, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm unmarried. I have no kids. I'm not as far in my career as I wanted to be. And, you know, I'm holding myself to the standards of regular life. I don't own a house. I don't, you know, like these sorts of like things that like are weighing on me. And sometimes I think back, I'm like, I never had these worries when I was in the church, you know, but I had different sets of like worries in the church, mm -hmm. like other heavier, crazier sorts of worries. But yeah. these sorts of things that I'm worried about now and that like are, are metrics for me to feel like how successful the life I've lived, you know, in, you know, according to society, you know, these right. sorts of social norms that I didn't live by those social norms before, you know, because I, I, all I was thinking about is like, I can't wait to die and go to heaven, you know, but now like we have a life that we're, we're trying to accomplish things in. And, you know, of course, like everyone has different concepts for spirituality, but you know, before when you're in the church, it takes over your entire life. And 
you didn't have to worry about these sorts of things. Like if you bought a property, you'd feel like a sinner. If you had a kid, you'd feel like a sinner. If you advanced in your career, you'd feel like a sinner. Like mm-hmm. all of these things, like you hurt yourself to, you know, all the things that the world will look at, like accomplishments and, you know, steps of life. You know, we forego all those things and we focus only on the church things. And now we're in the world and we're a thousand million steps behind where we should be or we feel like we would have been. And it just seems like such a big mountain to climb that it almost seems like, wow, if I went back, I wouldn't have to worry about these things. Like all these things I want to accomplish now and all these things like I should be doing now I can't like I have, you know, where's my 401k at? Where's my, you know, <laughs> you think about this stuff now, but like you didn't worry about it before. So it makes it seem just easier to retreat back into La La Land where, you know, yeah, all you had to worry about is bearing fruit and giving all your money. And, you know, like, that's it. Like there wasn't other things to worry about. So I, I feel like there's definitely that aspect of, the world that will scare you back into the church. Yeah. And it's because Um, the church that, you know, that you're so far behind that you want to go back. Yeah. And it's so true. Um, You know, and then, and then you struggle to, you struggle to care about any of those things after leaving too. You're like, I don't care. Like, cause you, you were drilled. So we were drilled so deeply that none of these things had purpose. Mm-hmm. And now you're trying to, you know, find care about them. things you never cared about before. <laughs> yeah. So um it was when you were 21 when you went in. <laughs> so yeah. It was never on your radar. Yeah. So it's just crazy. But you know, I, I will say that um I'm so glad that um though of course, you know, the it takes time, a lot of time to undo all of that, but it's so worth it. And, um, you know, I, I don't want that to like scare anybody into like no. going back or not leaving. Um, because I, you know, I'm so glad now that I, I chose myself and that I'm doing things for myself now and no one will ever, um, have influence over me like that when it comes to my spirituality or my life in general. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we all owe it to ourselves to go out and try new things. And yeah. better just, late than ever. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've had some of the best experiences now. And um, it, it's so worth it to do that that hard and ugly work of, you know, um, learning these tactics so that you can, you know, understand them and not not fall into them because you know you are we are so vulnerable when we leave to not only going back to the church but to you know getting into another cult or into an abusive relationship because it's just what our brain knows at the time um you know it's just what feels comfortable but um you know therapy 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 (laughs) and you know research um it's the best yeah and i i'm just thinking about some of the, the different things you said, just like that, that sense of peace that you, you felt going back and kind of just releasing yourself to this thing again. Uh, and then even you, Anthony, kind of describing this sense of like, well, I didn't have these worries back then when I wasn't really, you know, thinking about or considering the social pressures or norms or, 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 or what, you know, I feel like I should be doing. And I, I don't know. This this is more just a kind of just a, a thought, but to me, I think groups like the WMS and, and other many others, not just them, but there's there's to me there's such a thing as taking things that are legitimate and real and producing counterfeit versions of them that um, might you know have an appearance of of truth and have an appearance of something that's going to to benefit you and, and fulfill you and things like that, but ultimately are rooted in lies. But, you know, so I, I think of like Anthony, like this sense of, 
because you know there are these pressures and this anxiety that can come from society and so it can feel like well what maybe there's something maybe there is something to some of the aspects of how the WMS teaches you know we shouldn't be so concerned about these no. things but i think what they're doing in that they're taking they're taking what i see principles you know that you see in in scripture principles that jesus taught you know uh he he taught very clearly don't worry about your life don't worry about what you eat what you drink uh what you uh, what you're gonna wear your heavenly father knows what you need um but i think what they do is they take principles that are true because i i think there's something true about that i think there's a way to live in society to to get a job and to pursue a career, to pursue, pursue a family, to want to have a nice house, but to do that in a way where you're not, you're not riddled with anxiety and fear and thinking, um, I guess you're not burdened by what I think uh, so often us living in a Western society can be burdened by. You're not, you're not serving those things as, as your God, as it were, but you, you, you do have that sense of knowing Yes, I'm, I'm doing these things, but I have a heavenly father that loves me. And so I could have or lose these things and I'm still, I'm okay. Um, I don't have to have these things because that's not, these things are not where my peace is found. These things are not where my, my life is found. Uh, so I think what groups like the World Mission Society Church of God does is it, it takes, it sees those principles and it takes them, but then it, completely distorts and manipulates them and then puts them on people. But then what happens is people will see those things in the Bible and they'll think that that principle means one thing when really it means something completely different. Um, I think there's something in many of the things that Jesus taught that just gives a, a really pretty good way of life, a pretty good way of living. Um, and I think the WMS kind of capitalizes on some of those things, some of those principles that they can use to manipulate people ultimately. And so I think then it becomes difficult to differentiate between, you know, the true version and the false version. Um, but, but just, I guess all that just to say that I think, you know, what's, what would be so challenging for so many coming out of this group or others um, would be to think that, well, I, I, it must just all, all these principles, all these ideas are just garbage. And I, you know, there's no usefulness to them. There's no truth to any of it. When, when in reality, I think that um, it's good to recognize this, there's a counterfeit false version of that. Just in the same way I could, I could go in and create a realistic counterfeit lottery ticket. And I could and I could go out and start giving that to people, and I could convince them, hey, this is a real lottery ticket that's worth a million dollars, and that if I give that to somebody, that's going to produce certain emotions, a certain psychological response in the person I give that to, even though it's a, rooted in a complete lie. It has the capacity to produce certain emotional response. So the fact that I can do that and give somebody a false lottery ticket that will produce a real emotional response that doesn't mean that well you know when you come to find that that lottery ticket was actually made up it's a lie that doesn't prove that there's not actually a real legitimate lottery ticket where if you get that lottery ticket and experience certain emotions certain you know res uh, psychological response of joy and and elation or whatever well that's true that's real that that's rooted in something that is actually grounded in facts and so I just think that with with people coming out of this group, just having that having that before you, I guess, that just just because there was a counterfeit version of something that was handed to you that caused you so much pain and abuse, that doesn't therefore prove that that there isn't actually a legitimate real version of, of this this thing that really has been offered was was really kind of dangled before all you members which is really just peace and 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 salvation things like that hey look if you come here you can find peace with god i think so many of us have like you you talked about um earlier esperanza about this you always felt this closeness this nearness with god and so you you wanted to go deeper into that and you had this thing dangling out in front of you saying hey here it is here's the lottery ticket and and come to find wait a minute <laughs> That wasn't, that was all a lie and how, 
difficult and confusing that is, I know for so many of you coming out of that and then trying to navigate, well, what, where do I, where do I go? What do I do now? What is true? Is there a God? Is there, you know, so, so I just, yeah, I, I guess that's what, um, from the very beginning when I started doing these videos is the thing I try to stress is that I don't, you know, I understand any direction people go. I, I, I can't fault anybody for going, whether that's, atheism or whatever direction they go. I, I just, I can't imagine what that would be like to come out of something like this and have to try yeah. to navigate that. Um, I just have always wanted to st stress just to maybe consider for, for people out there listening that are kind of in this, that are in that situation, trying to navigate all this to, to just that realization that a counterfeit version of, of the, the the light i think that is discussed that is communicated in scripture the principles that promise to give peace and joy in our lives that just because there's a counterfeit version that might be offered to you that doesn't prove that there isn't actually a real version of that that can actually it is actually truthful and real and at the center of it when you dive deep into it what you're going to find is light and actual real light rather than exposing something that at its core is really dark and ugly and nasty. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely different for everybody. And for a lot, it's like the spiritual abuse there is very deep. Um, and it, you know, for, for quite a while, I wanted nothing to do with any of it um, as far as um, seeking my relationship with God again. <laughs> um, but um, I've decided now that, you know, I do still believe in God and I'm not going to let them take that away from me. <laughs> they, they did enough. Um, but, you know, it's um, that's, you know, between me and God, though, you know, I'm never going to let anyone influence me in that way ever again. Not, not a church, not a person. Um, you know, and I've actually done some things that, um, you, you know, I, I feel connected to God now if I'm, you know, in nature, um, or, you know, just I'll listen to some certain songs. Those have been helpful for me. Um, because you know what, I, I, I have faith in God. And I always had faith in God. I just don't have faith in the World Mission Society Church of God anymore. Um, and so uh, they can say I don't have faith. And I, I don't have faith in that church. It's fake. Um, but I, I do have faith in God. And, um, you know, it's not where it used to be. But that's okay. Like, I, I can't believe it still exists after... <laughs> after all of that, because I was so mad. Mm -hmm. I was like, how did you let this happen to me, God? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> like, I thought you were here, you know, and then, um, but it's okay, you know, like, I think, um, you know, maybe we were put there to help other people get out. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I, I actually, um, you know, because the, the Wimscock teaches that the Catholic Church is the organization of the devil, the Antichrist, um, you know, and I grew up Catholic. Um, so when I was back home for the holidays in New Mexico, um, just a couple weeks ago, um, I actually went to an old church that I grew up in, not to a service. I was not ready for that. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a uh, Catholic, um, but um, I, I just scheduled a um, session with the priest and I just laid out on the table, you know, all the things that the World Mission Society Church of God taught about the Catholic Church. Um, and it was really interesting. And I'm really glad that I did that because um, in the, in the WMS, you know, you can't ask questions. You can never point the finger at them. Um, but I, I sat down and I pointed the finger at this Catholic priest 
And, you know, I laid it all out on the table and was like, what's up with all this? Um, (laughs) You know, and not for a second did he argue with me. Did he fight with me? Did he make me feel uncomfortable? Um, He listened to every word, every breath that I had, um, never interrupted me. Um, and that's something that you will never experience in the, in the mm-hmm. world mission society of Church of God. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I won't go into detail about everything, you know, because I, I don't want this to be about doctrine, but there were some things that he said that um, just kind of stuck with me a little bit and were helpful for me. Um, you know, he, he said, um, because as we know, one thing that the WMS does is they're constantly attacking other churches. This is how they're wrong. And this is how that church is wrong. And this is, you know, and they think that that makes them right. Um, You know, and this priest said, um, it's not, he he said, uh, we don't do that. It's not helpful. It's not helpful for God's people to, teach and talk about other churches and how they're wrong. People come, they come to church to have some time set aside in their day to be with God. And if they're coming and they're hearing negativity, you know, that, that, that that does no good for that purpose. But also one thing he mentioned, um, you know, the church of God just preaches unity, 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 but they're constantly talking bad about other churches and other people and all that does is divide everybody. So, you know, they're not very, (laughs) they don't practice unity very well, you know, and, and that's, that was one thing you mentioned too about, you know, just the, the constant um, bashing on the other churches, you know, Mm -hmm. just doesn't encourage unity in that if, if everybody just stopped doing that, you know, the, the way that the, the WMS does it, you know, we might have some more peace in the world. Um, and, um, yeah, one thing too, um, you know, I, I asked him about, um, you know, okay, like, were we created in heaven before being on earth and did we sin in heaven? You know, what's your, your take on that, Mr. Catholic priest? And, uh, (laughs) yeah, we, we read through, um, you know, Genesis and, you know, though we, I, I like read the Bible while I was in the church, but you only see it their way. And I saw things that I just didn't even like realize before you just like <laughs> skip over. But, you know, he showed me that like when God was creating, creating everything, like God created this and it was good. God created the earth and it was good. God created us and it was good. God created everything to be good and to be enjoyed. And he's, and then he said, you're not being punished by being on the earth. It's not a punishment to be here. God created, like, look how beautiful it is outside. It's not a punishment. (laughs) You know, like God said, multiply the earth. I created this for you to enjoy, you know? So that, that was, um, you know, I don't mean to trigger anybody with you know, yeah. preaching and doctrine and stuff, but I think that was just very, um, I didn't realize I needed to hear that in the moment, just that, you know what, mm-hmm. oh, <laughs> yeah. I can actually enjoy some of these things and it's it's okay. And, yeah. and you know, God might actually enjoy that <laughs> mm-hmm. much rather than uh, being abused um, in the name yeah. of God. So yeah. yeah, or your spiritual prison. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's a, a a great point. Uh very good words there. And it just goes to kind of further point to that that contrast, I think, between the real and the counterfeit. The the counterfeit just makes you feel bad. It's just all about uh, laying this foundation of how bad you are, how unhappy God is with you, um, how much wrath you deserve, and it's kind of like heaven is just kind of like, like, you know, bubbling up with, with just wrath, just waiting to be poured out at any moment, unless you just, you just keep in line. And so just realizing that that's really, that is not 
it's not the story being to told in the Bible, like you said, from the first, mm -hmm. from the first pages. Um, and I, I believe even in, in when he says, you know, it is good in the creation narrative. Um, I think when he makes man, he says it is very good. Um, very good. Yeah. Not just good, yeah. but very good. Very good. Yeah. It's like what I've just done. This, this is very good. And we are created in God's image, supposed to be image, supposed to be reflections on the earth of a God who himself is light and his kingdom. Paul says the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. He says you can you can see in Paul's letters. There were these ideas arising. People were saying things like you can't. Oh, you can't eat that. You can't drink that. Oh, you can't. You can't worship on this day. You need to worship on that day. You see Paul in his epistles, like dealing with those sort of ideas. And so there's places like Romans 14 and even in, in the, the epistles to Timothy. Uh, at one point, he's, he says uh, the kingdom of God is not it's not about eating and drinking. It's not about what you put in your mouth or what you don't put in your mouth. He said it's about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is supposed to be this where we're having this interaction with God, with the living God, and we're knowing him as, a, you know, again, I, I, I'm so aware of the triggering words that can be said, but as a father, he, he's, he's like a, a dad. He's like, he's supposed to, he, we're supposed to think of him as a, a dad, Abba Father, which, which really means daddy. Uh, he, he's, he's somebody who's intimately loves us, and, and he's like a daddy, uh, that's the way we're supposed to perceive of God. And God's kingdom is not one of do this, do this, do this, tithe this, preach this much, pass over, or else. It's 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 an experience of knowing God's love. You just receive God freely loves me. And that mm -hmm. produces in your life righteousness, peace, and joy. When you know God loves you, you're going to want to love other people because because you just know I'm good. I'm, I, I, don't, I really have nothing to worry about. Um, and the WMS just takes all that again and just completely groups like it too, makes yeah. it impossible to see that you have a completely different perception of God, which is why I think you have, again, Paul constantly in the New Testament having to deal with, you know, quote unquote, false gospels and false versions of Jesus and people coming and he's recognizing, oh my gosh, look at what people are saying this and teaching this to the church. And then he's most of Paul's epistles, most of the New Testament is letters being written to say, guys, this is garbage. All this stuff you're hearing, it's garbage. Like you're, yeah. you've, you're, you're moving away from the grace of God in Galatians, and you're going back to all these rules and rituals and regulations, thinking that God basically God's just angry at you, and he wants you to do all these things to kind of climb the ladder. Um, and so I just think that's that's – yeah, I, I think your your words are hearing you say that. That's in, just encouraging to me, and I, I think will be to so many others. If that's just you can enjoy life <laughs> and not worry that that's going to upset God. As far as I do have, um, for me, I have one one more uh, question though. Yeah. Uh, there are sometimes members who are, you know, one either considering the idea to leave, or maybe they've already made that decision and now they're at the point where they are worried whether or not they made their wrong choice and they consider going back. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things could you do to give them encouragement to continue on leaving this abusive uh, organization that's, you know, obviously we know it's full of manipulation and lies and coercion and uh, misinformation and, you know, false doctrine and, you know, all these things we now know after leaving, but what, what could you give as advice to somebody who's, you know, in the same sort of spiritual emotional state that you were in when you first left, where it's like, although I left, I believe, and I wish I were still there, you know, but I made this choice to separate myself at the moment, but it, maybe it's permanent, maybe it's not. Like speak to that person, speak to you back then. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned, you know, um, the best thing you can do is research. Um, and for me, I was terrified to even look at any of it with my own eyeballs. <laughs> 
So, you know, thankfully today, um, you know, you can put on a video, just listen. Um, I think, um, I think it's important to look back and think has, has your decision been an informed decision? You know, when you were at the church, anything that you were doing, um, was it something you were doing just because you were told and you believed and were you given all the information? Um, and you, you owe it to yourself to make an informed decision as to whether or not you want to, you know, stay out of the church or leave the church or go back or stay in. Um, you know, the, the church themselves says the truth always stands and it does. The truth can always be proven right. Um, and 100%, if you research the church in depth, um, you will find that there is no truth in what they're teaching. Um, and of course, you know, you don't, you don't want that. Of course, you don't, you don't want uh, what you believe in to be wrong. You don't want all the money and time um, and the relationships you lost um, to be for nothing. But would you rather start that journey now of being out, figuring it out and healing? Or do you want to go back and then be in the same spot a few years later? You know, um, because again, the, the, the doubts that you have, the feelings that you have, um, that's your, your gut and your intuition, and it's going to keep coming up and it's not your sinful nature. It's again, your, your brain trying to protect yourself because it, it knows something's up though. You've been brainwashed to believe that that's the safest, safest place, you know, then why, why is your mind trying to, um, get you out? It's cause your, your brain knows something you don't. So just yeah. research and, you know, a little bit at a time, whatever, you know, watch or listen to whatever sticks to you in that moment. And you don't have to have it all figured out, but just take your time and be nice to yourself. Most importantly, yeah, yeah it's, it's not your fault. Um, happens to some of the best people. <laughs> And, um, yeah, just keep going in the direction that's right for you while being informed, get the information, <laughs> make sure you're not being lied to. Yeah. So go ahead. If you were say oh, no, 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 no. Oh, uh, yeah. So that too, in terms of, um, where where sh where should I go? Because I think that that's the way the question is often framed. The people who who are struggling, maybe in that that place of on the verge of leaving, or maybe they have, but they're wanting, they're thinking maybe they should go back. I get that question all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Where where else should I go? I get that in an, from antagonistic people who are still kind of deeply ingrained in it. I think who are saying like, oh yeah, right. Like wh yeah. where else? What other church has the truth? But some mm -hmm. people have that, and I think it's because of that, as we were talking about earlier, they, they create a problem and then they present the solution. And, and so you still have, so many people still have ingrained in them this idea, this false notion that there's a problem. Um, and so that question, I think, arises from them still sort of assuming the truthfulness of that problem that's been presented to them. Mm -hmm that you have to find, you know, one true church or, but, and, and I don't, I don't want to ask you to repeat what you just, what you just said. And hopefully this isn't too much of a repeat of the same question, but I guess what, is there anything that you might say to those people asking that specific question? Where, where should yeah. I go? Like, what should I do now? Yeah. I think, um, again, you don't have to have all the answers, 
but um, you know, I, I know that that if you're there at the church, you believe that you're following God. And again, your intuition is God given. And so if this keeps coming up, that you're feeling uncomfortable, you're questioning if, if you're in the right place, um, you have to give attention to that. And just know that all of these regulations that you're given, you know, and, and then so you're asking like, okay, well, you know, I have to keep this feast and that feast and I have to do this or else I'm going to go to hell. So where do I go? Because nowhere else is keeping these, even though I know now that this place is wrong and they're abusing people, like where else do I go to keep these things? Um, although, of course, like it is very triggering, especially at first to um, read any or listen to anything doctrine wise that's against the church, um, like digging into the doctrine and tearing it apart. But you will find that um, when you actually read the context in the Bible around where the regulations are that they've given you, you'll find that that's not the intention of it. You don't have to do that in order to be with God. Um, and I think just, you know, again, research, the, the truth will stand. And so you'll see that um, you don't have to go run somewhere else. Again, you're so vulnerable to get into another environment that has the same abusive and coercive dynamic. Um, so, you know, it's really important to, to understand what you were taught um, and, and how it was wrong, even though it's really hard to, to face and admit, but again, it's so important, you know, and, and just look back at how many times you were put in really dangerous situations, situations of extreme poverty. We were all forced into poverty in that church. Um, you know, I, I'm, sh you miss your family, you miss your friends, they miss you. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's what I've got <laughs> as far <laughs> as that goes. That's yeah. It's good advice. Yeah. yeah thanks. Well, well, <laughs> we are drawing close to four hours, not quite at four hours yet. And so, um, I, I want to respect both of your time and, and, and continue. I think we could probably keep talking. I could keep asking questions for a long time, but, um, very much enjoyed this conversation. And I think there's a lot of, um, helpful insights that you you've given that, that I hope people will, will hear. And, um, I know, as, as is the case with any former member who shares their story, there's going to be many people helped by, by you doing this. So, so thank you again for, for being willing to, to share your story. So, um, Anthony, um, I don't know if you have any final thoughts or, or questions you want to, to ask before we wrap up. Yeah, no, uh, just, um, I just wanted to thank Esperanza too for, um, it's not an easy topic. It's not an easy topic. And, um, it's not easy to put out there. And mm -hmm. thank you for your strength for being able to to speak to it and let other people know who are going through that, that they're not alone and that it's not right. And this guy is, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to say this, <laughs> but you know, um, I, I just, I just thank you for your strength to be able to share yeah. this because um, ultimately everything that, you know, the reason why I, I hop on here to help and the reason Jordan does this is to help people and you being here and you sharing your story is helping people. And whether it be, uh, the, the day this premieres that, you know, and people see and they, they're out and they, they, it resonates with them or maybe down the line, two years from now, this video is going to be on and somebody's going to be able to also probably going through the same thing in the same situation mm -hmm. and realize that this is something that's been going on and that, you know, they're not wrong. They're not crazy. And it's not a problem with them. It's a problem with the organization 
So you coming on and you expressing this is huge. So, you know, thank you for being vulnerable and open enough to share this experience that you've had. Thank you guys for uh, creating a safe space. Um, yeah, you really help in a lot of people. Um, and and I, I would not um, be where I'm at right now <laughs> without uh, the Great Light Studios platform. Um, all your videos have helped me so much. So um, I, I really felt, uh, you know, pay it forward. <laughs> <laughs> and also I uh, can't let them win. I'm not gonna let them, you know, bully me, abuse me. And I don't want other people thinking that it's okay what they're doing to them. So yeah, they're um, going down. Not going to stop. Not yeah. going to stop. <laughs> One video at a time.